Test two. Yep. Testing. Testing, testing one, two. Testing one, two, one, two. Test, 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 one, test. Two. This was super hot. Two, two. Number four is kind of low. Testing one, two, one, two. Yeah. Let me know if we're going to test four. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing sounds good. I'm on three. Testing one, two, one, two. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, one, two. Testing one, two, three, four. One, two, one, two. Testing one, two, one, two. Testing one, two. Testing one, two, one, two. Testing one, two.
Testing one, two, testing one, two, three, four. Test one, test two, two. Yes, sir.
Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So happy to have you here today for this uh, Farm Bill listening session. Thank you all for coming and registering through Farmers.gov. I'm seeing some more people follow through into the auditorium here. We're also live streaming this on Farmers.gov this morning. So we look forward to the feedback we're going to get on how we can improve our programs here at USDA. And this morning we're going to take comments on crop insurance, ARC PLC, disaster programs, marketing assistance loans, program eligibility, and we're going to touch on dairy just before breaking for lunch. Uh, we'll have about 30 minutes for lunch, and then when we come back, we're going to touch on credit and farm loans. We've got the afternoon to talk about conservation, customer service, and we're also going to take some general comments that you may have. So before we get underway today, I'm going to welcome to the stage Bill Northey. He's the former Secretary of Agriculture of Iowa, now USDA's Under Secretary of Farm Production and Conservation, and he'd like to welcome you all to the nation's capital today. Bill. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sean. Uh, certainly, thank you all for, uh, for being here this morning, whether you're here in person or online. Uh, we're looking forward to the day. Uh, looking forward to hearing your comments. Uh, you know, farm bills certainly are, by most of us, considered the most important piece of legislation uh, that Congress passes. Uh, and it certainly gets all the attention uh, as we build up to it. And now the attention is uh, what's in those farm bills. Uh, this farm bill. Uh, was passed with an overwhelming amount of bipartisan support, uh, which is a great start to, for us to be able to see uh, how Congress came together around the policies in this Farm Bill. Uh, our responsibilities at USGA is to carry out Congress's intentions. Um, and their certainly intentions are that it works. Uh, the challenge, of course, for all of us is every farm is different. It's easy. It's it's easy to have broad goals. It's much more challenging to have programs and the specifics and the rules uh, that will work on every farm. Uh, you look across the country and every farm, ranch, or forest land is a little different. Uh, it's in a different place. It's by a different family. It's got a different history, maybe even different ownership. Uh, certainly farms from uh, cornfields to cranberry bugs, uh, wetlands um, and forests, uh, wet years and dry years. This farm bill, these provisions have to work in all those circumstances. And they have to work for farm, uh, farm families, ranch families, forest owning families that are all different. Every one of them is different. And that's what you all here to help us with, to understand those things uh, that help this farm bill and the way that we write it work for more of the families across the country. And so it's awful important uh, for us to be able to hear what you all have to say, uh, for us to be able to carry out the intention of Congress. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's, we're certainly gratified with the, uh, the number of folks that have already sent in comments, uh, the folks that have signed up to be able to speak today. Uh, we know that there's a lot of folks that are planning to be online as well. Uh, and it'll be such that you can go and look back online and be able to see the comments. We're going to have a lot of our staff here. We already have quite a few of our staff here uh, this morning. But as different programs come, you'll see other staff come in and out uh, during the day. So this is important to us to be able to hear what you have to say about the programs that folks are working on to be able to make sure that uh, that we get these written in a way that, that works in nearly every circumstance across the country. Um, so this um, is an important day for us. We've been looking forward to this. We are working hard at getting the Farm Bill provisions written and get them out as soon as we can. We also want to make sure that they're as right as they can be for all of you. And so this role, uh, any other opportunity that you have to be able to share with us your concerns is important to us. You will see later in the day, as Sean mentioned, uh, there is a session specifically even asking for customer service comments. Uh, you probably heard the secretary talk about USDA being the most uh, efficient, the most effective, and the most customer service focused part of the federal government. And believe me, that's not just a line. Uh, he asks us every week about how are we doing? What are we doing to be able to make that happen? How are our programs solving that? Are we making it easier for folks to understand our programs? Uh, are they working better? Do they work efficiently so a person doesn't have to spend hours and hours at, 
at a counter in a service center out there? How do we make this work and what's the impact on our customers across the country? Uh, and so we expect certainly if there's some comments that you have uh, for that session this afternoon, we look forward to that. But we know that that'll be embedded in a lot of your comments uh, as we go along uh, the day about how we can make these programs work better for the folks that you're very aware of and can bring some information to us about how these programs impact folks. Um, so we're looking forward to the day. Uh, thank you for taking time uh, out of your busy schedule to be able to be here. Uh, this is important to us. This will make our implementation of the Farm Bill better. This will make it work better at a counter for farm families out there. And let me assure you that as we talk about program provisions, we certainly talk about what's the law say, what was the intent of Congress, but we also talk about what's the impact on a counter, what's the impact on a kitchen table out in the countryside of the real life folks that these farm bills were written for. Uh, and uh, you're here to help us with that, and we look forward to your comments. So, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your engagement. Uh, we look forward to working together. Uh, you will hear from our folks the things that we'd like to be able to hear about, but this is a rulemaking time, uh, so you won't be able to have a conversation with us about the things that, that we're considering or specific questions about proposals. We don't have those. Uh, this is a listening session. Uh, and so we intend to listen, absolutely listen. Um, but we're not going to be able to have kind of the back and forth discussions that, that uh, certainly would be very satisfying in some cases, but are not uh, available to us in this kind of setting at this kind of time. Uh, but uh, we thank you for coming, uh, sharing, and uh, look forward to your comments. Thank you all. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Bill. Uh, before we get underway, I just wanted to put out some, some housekeeping notes for today. Please keep your visitor passes on you at all times. Above your waist, please, while you're in the building. Uh, and if you leave the building, just keep in mind you're going to have to go through screening again. That's something to, to bear in mind if you want to step outside. Uh, also, for security reasons, we're going to ask that uh, all visitors stay in the hallway outside the auditorium or at Wings 5 and Wing 3. Wing 5 is where the restrooms are located. You go out of the auditorium just to the right here. Cafeteria is in wing three. We have a press room for members of the media just across the hallway from the auditorium. That's room 1079. And just keep in mind later today, the space may be limited here in the Jefferson. If you'd like to watch this, you can also do so in the back of the cafeteria. And again, that's wing three. If you haven't done so already, we'd ask that you kindly silence your cell phones, uh, at least while you're here in the auditorium. We have two microphones set aside for those of you who want to comment down the aisles here. We just ask that uh, if you have a comment to give on crop insurance, which we're about to touch on, just line up right at the first row below here. And we want to be fair to everybody attending, so please try and keep your comments to under four minutes so that we can make sure everyone has time to speak. And our first area of comment today is going to be federal crop insurance. And the administrator of the Risk Management Agency is here, Martin Barbary. He's the former president of the National Corn Growers Association. And for about the past two years, he's been heading up crop insurance right here at USDA. Martin? Thanks, Sean. Uh, first, I'd like to ask my team to come up. We're going to have the team up here. I want everybody to, to understand we're really paying attention. As the Undersecretary said, we're here to listen. You know, I, I spent a lot of time serving both Farm Bureau and the corn industry. As Sean said, I was president of National Corn Growers in 2014. So for the past 25 or 30 years, I've spent my time out here with you, making comments, going to, to listening sessions, to, to giving testimony. So I, so I understand how it feels to be out there giving that testimony and making sure people are here to listen. And I trust me, we are here to listen. We want to understand how these things affect you. The undersecretary said, you know, we want to know how it affects you at the kitchen table and how it affects you at the counter, at the FSA office or the NRCS office or for speaking with our RMA agents. We, we think that's really, really important. A um, little bit about myself. Um, I was raised on a crop and livestock farm in southeastern Illinois, farmed with my father after getting out of college. Um, we raised corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, sometimes grain sorghum. Had a little stint raising tobacco in the early 2000s. So I've, I've had some experience on some, some specialty crops. We Today we raise soy, seed soybeans and 
and white corn, which are identity preserved crops. So I kind of understand that side of it. Uh, but I, my point is that, that I'm a farmer. I still own half the farm at home today. So, so I understand what crop insurance had affects the farmer back home. And I, I've been able to bring that into the agency. I think it's important that we do that. Uh, as Sean said, I, you know, I've served the ag industry for 30 plus years. So, so we're here today to hear your comments about the 2018 Farm Bill. But during that time, I want you to remember that, that we have a lot of information available on our website at www.rma.usda.gov. And so if there's any questions you have about policies or how things might work, there's a, just a wealth of information on that website, and you can go to that and learn more about it. Today we're here to hear about the Farm Bill and our visions for the Farm Bill. Some of the things in the Farm Bill RMA has already enacted. We've completed the multi-county enterprise unit, which is available for the 2019 crops, where a producer can, can take an enterprise unit in one county and say he's got a, a field or two in another county. He can bring that in and get the enterprise unit discount on the whole thing. Uh, we have already appointed specialty crop liaisons in all of our regional offices. Those are already in place and are working on specialty crops all the time. The APH continued authority. We, we already issued procedures for the 2019 crop year to limit the, the if you have a couple of bad years, there's still a limit of a, a cup on how far down your APH can go, limited to 10%. And so there'll be, you know, there'll be additional rulemaking on that as we come forward, and we're here to listen to those comments. In the Farm Bill, we also were, were given the task of, of 12 studies that will help RMA and industry look at new ways to bring innovative insurance products to producers if they are feasible, and you know, we got to make sure they're feasibly marketable, that the producers will buy them, and that they're actuarially sound. That's one of the big things that, that when we look at a new policy, a new way to do things, is it, is it marketable? Will producers use it? Is it actuarially sound for both the industry, for the producer, and for the American taxpayer who funds this whole program? So, you know, we really think that's important. We will be receiving more data from FSA and NAS. We've, we begin to use that data more effectively, looking at different things from, from cover cropping data to just all kinds of different things that we use in our, in our process. The ACRSI, the Annual Acreage Crop Reporting Streamlined Initiative, was, was put in the 2014 Farm Bill. There's, it's strengthened in this Farm Bill that the administration in the last couple of years has made it a priority, and we're working hard to get that in place. You know, I, I told you I've, I've spent a lot of time doing what you're doing here and coming and doing that, and I'm here to listen today. And with that, I have with me my team here in D.C. I have to my first left here is Keith Gray, who is the RMA Administrator Chief of Staff. Next is Dolores Dean. She is Acting Deputy Administrator for Insurance Services. I have R.J. Lair, who is my Policy Advisor, and Heather Manzano, who is the Deputy Administrator for Compliance, and Heather was also Acting Administrator before I got here. So she brings a wealth of knowledge that they all do. It's, just, it's a great team. And with that, we're here to listen, Sean. All right, thank you, Martin. And if you have questions about crop insurance, we'd ask you at this time, please come forward. Uh, if you have some comments that you'd like to give on crop insurance, uh, just please line up right here on the front row. I see some folks making their way down here. And we'd also ask that when, uh, when you're called upon, please give your name, tell us where you're from, your organization. And try and keep your comments to four minutes. All right, we'll start over here, sir. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Ferd Hefner. I'm a senior advisor to the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition here in Washington. We represent over 125 organizations around the country. Let me start with the cover crop question. Uh, we're delighted that the new Farm Bill includes that provision and includes a definition for cover, cover crop termination. Our number one recommendation is that you use that and you use the good uh, farming practice process and uh, eliminate the need for rigid rules and, and guidelines. Um, we believe farmers need the flexibility to be able to respond to new research and to their own experience with best practices and we think the good farming practice process should be used uh, in place of rigid guidelines. So that would be our top recommendation on that. I would also add that this is the, a perfect time to take the existing guidance uh, uh, that the agency uh, did to say that uh, all conservation practices that NRCS has 
uh, come out with are acceptable as good farming practices. The problem with the existing guidance is it has a qualification. We think this is the perfect time to remove the qualification. This is a real test for FPAC. Can one agency and the other agency actually have the same uh, uh, provisions and guidance? So we think this is the time to get rid of all the caveats and make it full stop. If you're doing an NRCS practice, it's good farming by definition. So we encourage you to do that. There was a question on whole farm. We have lots of recommendations on whole farm that I can't go into today, but I'll just say a few things. One, we're delighted about the stakeholder process the Farm Bill calls for. We very much want to participate in that. Um, we believe there are some things that should be done immediately for the next crop insurance year, removing the cap on livestock and nursery products, uh, expanding or liberalizing the rules for expanding operations, and uh, counting government payments in the uh, calculation of historic revenue. We think those are all important and could all be done immediately. But to the question of paperwork reduction, we, there, there are lots of things that could be done. We think the number one thing would be to eliminate the requirement that expenses uh, be calculated and reported each year. No other revenue policy has that kind of uh, provision and it would definitely simplify paperwork to do that. There was a question on, on uh, specialty crops and local food. We think, honestly, the best thing that can be done is to improve whole farm <laughs> revenue protection. Um, but we also realize that uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from uh, community-supported agriculture uh, folks uh, that whole farm maybe doesn't work quite for them. So we would focus the R&D on the local f food policy that the Farm Bill calls for, specifically on the needs of community-supported agriculture. I want to touch briefly on NAP. I know that's a FSA thing, but there are provisions in the Farm Bill that relate to you all. Uh, we'll have recommendations specifically for FSA on that as well. But with respect to Section 11102 and 11105, um, uh, that calls for FSA to share that NAP data and for the board to consider it and for the board to propose new policies either for additional commodities or for expanding the counties and states under which they come. We think that's really important. We think NAP can really be an on-ramp, uh, particularly for beginning farmers into crop insurance, and we would encourage FSA and, and uh, RMA to work together um, to have a whole farm corollary in NAP that beginning farmers could use as an on-ramp to whole farm in RMA. Uh, we are also strongly supportive of the conservation data provision in the miscellaneous title. urge you to do that report uh, robustly and as soon as possible. We think that's another great example of where FPAC can bring production and conservation together and bring them into alignment. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. We'll have a lot more details in our written comments. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. We're going to go to the other side of the aisle here. Please, uh, please tell us your name. Thanks. My name is Bridget Hill Zayat. I work for Hoban Law Group. We're based in Denver. Uh, we represent hemp farmers in states like Colorado and Kentucky. Um, so we respectfully request that the USDA expeditiously promulgate regulations um, so that the states that are currently in session can craft their programs. Um, any delay could set them back years. So if you think about it, uh, state programs would be pushed back to 2020. 2021 would be the earliest that crops could actually start going. Um, so that is our biggest concern. Um, and it's related to insurance in the sense that these are small farmers. Um, they can't get insurance until all of these rules are promulgated. Um, these are small folks. So this is really crucial to their success. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Lowell Randall. I'm here on behalf of Armtech Insurance Services, uh, one of the uh, approved insurance providers, or AIPs. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, to have this uh, listening session. Uh, we've been very active in the Farm Bill process, uh, working with Congress, working with the Department, working with our fellow uh, AIPs and, and rel related associations. and. Uh, I, w I would like to just highlight a few themes uh, and areas that we're interested in, what we're hearing from agents and, and producers, and some of these we've already communicated through some of our uh, industry associations, so some of these questions that, that I'll raise will, will seem familiar with what you've uh, received. But uh, 
Uh, I, I think first off, just the timing of implementation is something we continue to hear about. We know that uh, you're working expeditiously and that there were some uh, unforeseen uh, shutdown issues that maybe uh, slowed the process down a little bit. But um, you know, obviously uh, uh, getting the implementation moving as, as quickly as possible and, and what the priorities will be for the, the 2019 crop year, uh, obviously that certainty out in, in farm country is, is really important as well as uh, will there be uh, you know, what interim rules might be under uh, consideration for the 2020 crop year, um, you know, what program changes, authorizations might be anticipated in that rule. So clarity on those issues as, as quickly as possible would be uh, very helpful. Um, also, uh, the interactions between the various programs uh, are, are uh, raising questions. Uh, so for example, uh, with the uh, stacks, the uh, provision state the insured must uh, designate uh, acres of the crop that will be covered by stacks or uh, SEO uh, uh, by uh, uh, sales closing date. So if a farmer has not distinguished which acres are in uh, ARC or PLC, uh, how does the farmer make the decision on which ARC acres are going to go into SEO or stacks by sales closing date? So one of those kind of questions, you know, how are these programs interrelating? The clarity on that is, is really important. Um, the timing, uh, so it looks like uh, ARC PLC signups uh, won't happen until after uh, closing dates. So uh, how will the ARC sign up impact those who have uh, bought SEO or stacks uh, in, in 2019? So um, those are the kinds of questions that uh, we, we'd like that clarity on how these programs are interrelating. We know you're working on those, but just highlighting those thematic areas where that clarity in, in working with the AIPs and, and the producer community is, is really important. And then uh, a final area, just touch on uh, the, the previous speaker uh, talked about the hemp. Uh, obviously that's creating lots of interest, lots of questions, and uh, we know you're working on that, uh, but uh, some questions that have come up, you know, who's going to be responsible for verifying that a producer is licensed to produce industrial hemp? What are the implications for AIPs in that area? Will hemp be insurable under a whole farm revenue protection? Uh, will there be a, a, a NAP uh, pr uh, provision there uh, for, uh, for hemp? Um, if hemp is determined to be uh, eligible for whole farm, uh, will that decision be retroactive for any other earlier closing dates? Um, and if it's an uninsurable commodity under whole farm, uh, how would that revenue be counted uh, in, in claim situations? So, um, you know, lots of lots of questions that are arising. Uh, another would THC levels be an insurable uh, cause of uh, uh, for a covered loss? Just a few of these issues that we continue to be thinking about. I'm sure you're thinking about, and we're hearing from uh, agents and producers. We want to be a partner. Uh, we think that public-private partnership is critical. So, uh, you know, we stand ready to work with you and your teams as you implement, and, and we'll also be working through our associations as well. And we look forward to a smooth uh, implementation process and working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Ask Hi. your name and uh, tell us your organization. I'm Laura Bryant with the Natural Resources Defense Council, and I uh, am submitting a few comments on different sections of the Farm Bill. I'll focus right now my comments a little bit on, on cover crops and the crop insurance, and then um, also just some other comments on uh, the Soil Organic Carbon Program. So to echo other comments here today, uh, we just really want to uh, recommend that the cover crop termination guidelines are as flexible as possible. Um, no other farm management decision has attracted the scrutiny of cover crops and um, cover crop farmers have lost eligibility in the past uh, due to uh, their cover crop practices. Um, it was the Federal Register asked for examples and we're going to be providing some of those separately in our written comments, uh, but I think it's also important to consider um, besides those specific examples, examples of people who have lost eligibility or been subject to audit, the effect that this has had on other cover crop growers who are making decisions about whether they're going to plant them or not. Um, even years after an event has happened where a farmer has lost 
uh, their crop insurance, other farmers are going to choose not to plant them because of the rumor of that happening. Um, we've also sat in the room with um, innovative cover crop farmers a number of times who have told us that they've either foregone crop insurance or with other farmers who have foregone planting cover crops um, because uh, they feel that the guidelines are too restrictive. So we just strongly urge uh, RMA to develop guidelines that are as flexible as possible. A grower in Western Iowa, for example, uh, reached out to us and asked that Iowa growers be allowed to terminate their rye after emergence of soybeans because research shows that this doesn't have an effect on the soybean crop and there's benefits to the rye being allowed to, to grow to a, a fuller stage before term termination. But if I were to give you all the different examples of all the ways that cover crop farmers would like the rules to be changed, it would be too many. So that's why the need to just make those restrictions not so prescriptive, and make them as flexible as possible. And then my other comments aren't really uh, so much related to RMA, but I'll just um, read them for the room. So we're really strongly supportive of the soil health demonstration trial um, that was written into the conservation innovation grants section of the program and uh, are looking forward to uh, working with USDA on the implementation of that. We see this as an opportunity to reward farmers for a soil carbon performance and to um, make measurements that are, are based, uh, that have a baseline and where we can see measurable improvements on soil carbon gains. Um, and we look forward to working with USDA on um, implementing that program and uh, have have goals and, and would recommend that uh, this be geared towards a soil organic carbon um, conservation activity plan in the long run um, and develop a standardized methodology that can be used across agencies for uh, measuring performance. And I'll restrict the rest of my remarks to the written comments. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your comments on cover crops and eligibility. Hi, good morning. I'm Deb Atwood, and I am here on behalf of AGREE's uh, Conservation and Crop Insurance Task Force, um, which is a very diverse group of people. I know I've met some of you many times with our producers, our academics, our conservation leaders, and former USDA leadership. Uh, I, I know the other previous speakers have spoken to the issue of cover crop termination and flexibility. I echo, of course, their comments, but I would add a couple of more points. One is the point about uh, getting the guidance out sooner as opposed to later. I think there's enough information for you to act uh, sooner. Um, so instead of delaying, we would like this uh, guidance to go so farmers can and plant uh, this year um, according, according to the guidance. Um, I think the point about uh, the updated law allows farmers to use cover crops in summer fallow growing regions without adversely affecting their el eligibility for summer fallow crop insurance as long as they follow good practices um, is also an element that uh, we hope you can move quickly on. And the business of actuarial soundness, uh, we will provide further comment for the record to show that we believe that cover crops, if done properly and terminated properly, will Im actually maybe possibly improve actuarial soundness. So thank you for allowing me to speak. All right. Thank you, Deb. Appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Cindy Ayers, and I'm a small farmer, an urban farmer from Jackson, Mississippi. And my information and task that we hope that you would consider is, too, to look at the, the NAF as relates to small farmers, and I'm talking small minority farmers throughout this country, to actually look at NAP and to look at taking in more crops under the NAP heading. Because as a small farmer, not being able to get any insurance other than NAP, we feel very much disenfranchised by not having enough of our farms covered under that for the products we grow and we hope to grow. I also would like to echo the 11102 and the 11105, as the gentleman has said earlier, as it relates to NAP, to really truly look at that. Our other concern is soil health. As an urban farmer and as a small farmer, soil health is very important to us. However, we've still been in a predicament where we cannot do as much as we can because of some of the tasks that we do not have. I ask you to consider looking at more 
uh, opportunities in policy centers, especially one for the 1890s that we actually need more research and more policy on to help direct small farmers. As an urban small farmer, I'm hoping that you look closely with the new part under the Farm Bill as it relates to urban farmers. We truly are there. We want to look at how we can improve our food deserts. In order to do that, we have to be able to grow more food. In order to do that, we got to be feel comfortable in the m amount of dollars we're putting in to help this. So again, anything you can do to help us as it relates to NAP and any other insurance that we can actually bring to Bionda would make a difference. I'm Cindy Ayers, and I'm an urban farmer. All right. Thank you, Cindy. Appreciate you coming all the way from Mississippi. Good morning. Good morning. I am Courtney Moran, hemp attorney and founding principal of Earth Law LLC, a cannabis hemp law firm with the practice base in Oregon. I'm a co-founder and chief legislative strategist for Agricultural Hemp Solutions, an all-inclusive advisory firm guiding the evolution of the U.S. hemp industry through bill passage and comprehensive hemp program implementation. We have passed seven bills to date in five states and one federally. I'm co-founder and president of the Oregon Industrial Hemp Farmers Association, an Oregon nonprofit collective of Oregon hemp farmers and handlers. We passed three bills to date, growing Oregon's hemp industry from nine farmers in 2015 to over 570 in three and a half years. I'm co-founder and president of the Pacific Northwest Hemp Industries Association, the regional chapter of the National Hemp Industries Association representing Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. I serve on the board of directors for the National Hemp Industries Association, a membership-based nonprofit trade association originally formed in 1994 to educate the public and advance the hemp economy for the benefit of our members, the public, and the planet. We currently have over 1,000 members. I'm the elected HIA board representative on the U.S. Hemp Roundtable Board. I serve on the board of directors for National Normal, and I also serve on the board of directors for the National Cannabis Bar Association. Additionally, I had the privilege of working pro bono for the last two years with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Senator Ron Whiting in the drafting of the Hemp Farming Act of 2018, the language of which was included in the 2018 Farm Bill legalizing hemp. As such, I have first-hand knowledge of the congressional intent of the hemp provisions included in the 2018 Farm Bill. I testify today on behalf of the hemp industry at large. The 2018 Farm Bill provided key language that supports hemp growth, the newly legal agricultural commodity. This includes making the hemp crop eligible for federal crop insurance on, through sections 11101, 11106, 11113, 11119, and 11121 with oversight by USDA's Risk Management Agency. Well, not specifically listed in the Federal Register notice for today's listening session, but relevant to the discussion, the USDA is just beginning to develop regulations to implement hemp legalization, including eligibility for crop insurance. Section 10113 of the 2018 Farm Bill instructs USDA to administer a program that allows individuals to cultivate, grow, and sell hemp and hemp derivatives. This section authorizes states and tribal governments to regulate hemp production in their jurisdictions by establishing through USDA approval, hemp production, cultivation, testing, and distribution plans. Further, Section 10114 provides that nothing in the horticultural title in the 2018 Farm Bill prohibits interstate commerce of hemp or hemp products and further prevents states and tribal governments from prohibiting the transportation of hemp and hemp products through the state or territory of the Indian tribe. These changes are exciting for our industry and provide the framework for positive economic impacts for farmers and agribusiness owners across the U.S. The eligibility for crop insurance is something hemp farmers across the U.S. are eager to realize, as they have had limited, if any, access to insurance for their crops produced under the agricultural pilot programs under the 2014 Farm Bill. Under the pilot programs, domestic production has grown from three states growing minimal acreage in 2014 to 24 states growing over 78,000 acres in 2018. Those figures are courtesy of Vote Hemp. This significant growth and progress has been achieved in absence of federal research funding. This industry has been built with publicly driven momentum and private funding. The provisions in the 2018 Farm Bill legalizing hemp research under the National Agricultural Research Extension and Teaching Policy Act of 1977 and the Critical Agricultural Materials Act will provide much needed additional research dollars and the industry is excited for this opportunity for further academic advancement. As USDA begins to develop regulations to implement hemp provisions in the 2018 Farm Bill, this industry respectfully requests USDA to pay close attention during regulation promulgation to the following. Farmers are currently preparing for planting for the 2019 production season. Will RMA issue guidance authorizing federal crop insurance in time for the 2019 production season? With changing weather patterns and devastating storms such as Hurricane Florence, farmers need this protection as soon as possible. Additionally, USDA NOP guidance currently does not provide for full hemp plant organic certification, namely for flower production for hemp-derived cannabinoids and the processing of hemp-derived cannabinoids. The industry respectfully requests NOP to issue guidance in time for the 2019 production season, clarifying authority for full plant organic certification. These and the following are examples of issues that have created and continue to create disruption for hemp farmers and businesses that otherwise normal agricultural businesses do not face. 
The change in federal status of hemp and thoughtful regulation by USDA can alleviate these and other concerns. For example, the news has been full of stories around the country of issues of hemp crop seizures by law enforcement for simple transportation of the commodity. Similarly, some trucking and shipping companies are not offering hemp farmers or hemp business owners transportation and shipping services. The industry needs USDA to issue clear guidance for transportation as well as protectionary measures pr to prohibit state-by-state -state discrimination of interstate hemp commerce and transportation. Another example is limited access to banking with financial institutions. Farmers and hemp agribusiness owners have struggled during the past four and a half years to secure bank accounts, and now federally legal, the industry needs the USDA to issue guidance to alleviate the current issues regarding access to banking. A few additional comments for the record. With regard to the 2018 Farm Bill's felon ban, it was Congress's intent to restrict only the individual applicant for the hemp permit for growing hemp and not for the restriction to apply to employees. For entity applicant, it was the intent that a company be eligible for a hemp permit if the company is owned by at least 51% of individuals with, who do not have a controlled substance felony in the last 10 years. Another comment is the industry needs standard protocol testing for excuse me, standard protocol established for testing for Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol levels. I'm almost done. Hemp plants in the field with reliable testing methods. We recommend the use of high performance liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, HPLC MS, for the testing of Delta 9 THC levels. I reiterate Delta 9 THC levels and not total THC. The definition for hemp specifically refers to Delta 9 and our neighbors to the North Canada have a booming hemp industry for the past 20 years with no issues testing specifically for Delta 9 THC. Additionally, testing of total THC will favor foreign varieties and imports, having a significant negative financial impact on domestic breeders and the varieties farmers across the U.S. have been currently growing for the past four years. Rod Kytus submitted additional details on this particular issue as well. The industry needs the USDA to take the lead to put an end to the disruption of basic commerce related to the hemp industry. Thank you for your consideration of these important issues. We look forward to timely USDA guidance that addresses these issues, aids the departments of agriculture and tribal governments in development of their state and tribal plans, and provides for a flourishing domestic hemp farming economy. I'd be happy to help the agency in any way that I can as you develop uh, regulations and guidance. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate hearing from our stakeholders in the Northwest. Good morning, Hello, sir. Administrator Barber, um, and thank you for all. Uh, I'll be short. Uh, my name is Jaime Castaneda. I'm with the National Milk Producers Federation. I'm a senior vice president for policy. Uh, it, I'll be very, very short. I just want to, you know, uh, as you know, dairy has never been uh, a big, big part of RMA because we have not had uh, any significant program or the, other than the LGM, the livestock gross margin. As you know, Congress, uh, RMA first has a, actually already approved another uh, dairy program, the Dairy Revenue uh, protection and then in addition to that uh, Congress made a major major significant uh, change with, with the livestock gross margin the LGM so now that actually we have uh, uh, not a cap on the amount of funding I think it is very important to work with the owners of LGM there are a focus on working with them to ensure that all farmers have access to to LGM uh, as, as of at least uh, last year, uh, the owners, uh, when they originally uh, put forward LGM because of the limitations on the amount of funding, they uh, had also a limitation of how much a farmer can use LGM. So we encourage you to work with uh, the, the owners to ensure that uh, the good job of Congress to expand and, and, and fund this program uh, it works for all farmers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments on LGM. We rolled out DRP a, a couple months ago. Yes, sir. Ooh, I can't talk as fast as that gal, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get my licks in here. I'm Tim Munns from Utah. I'm representing myself here today at this listening session. I'm a past president of Utah Cattlemen, so she's been involved with the National Cattlemen. A little background, I spent 10 years on a County Committee FSA and eight years of State Committee Chairman and on the technical. But anyway, thank you, gentlemen and ladies, today for holding this. Uh, the Chief, thank you for having these listening sessions. Uh, I'm in town with the Grazing Lands Coalition right now, but like I say, I am here representing myself as a farmer and rancher and thrill seeker in Utah. And uh, a couple of questions here or on Seattle and a crop insurance deal. In Utah, it's normal, and I talk loud because I can't hear, but maybe that's good for all of you. But uh, uh, 
normal practice is graze out fall wheat. After we get it planted and get it up like they do Kansas and Nebraska, there was a question a year or two ago said if we graze it, it was not insurable. And, and I didn't agree with that one to my agent. I think we got it ironed out, but I want to make that crystal clear that that's normal practice, custom and culture in our area. If we get fall wheat up high enough, if it rains enough, which is not too often, we want to graze that off with cattle in the fall and still be eligible. I've, I've bought crop insurance since 1982 and we quit the ad hoc disaster program through the regular uh, small grains program. But thank you for having it. And I, I, I do appreciate the fact that I can buy crop insurance, pay a premium, although it's subsidized and, and insure myself instead of asking for a disaster payment. I think that's the route we should be going. And, and if we could clarify that, <clears throat> the grazed wheat that was intended for harvest for grain, even though it is intended for harvest, we can fall graze that with cattle if it's up high enough, you know, and not detriment to the crop. So there was some graze out, I mean, we don't graze any wheat out. And if we did, we would, wouldn't buy the insurance on it. So that, can I give a comment on, as long as I'm here, on the conservation too? Absolutely. At this time? I can, thank you. Okay, I'm also, I own, uh, well, several thousand acres, me and my sons. And I mean, I've put a ranch together in the last 40, some 42 years. And we're buying a lot of these uh, farms in that valley that was once in CRP. I've been in CRP 20, 30 years, and I, I don't know the solution to that, where they ought to come back into some kind of production. But we're leaving them in the grass and putting cattle on them. We're fencing them, cross-fencing them, water them, graze manage, good management plans, plans with NRCS for controlled grazing, managed grazing. One thing, there's some of them existing contracts still on there that are eligible to be maintenance grazed. I was actually instrumental in the 2000 Farm Bill through NCBA getting grazing as a provision of maintenance pro protocol for for CRP lands other than burning, disking, and, and, and heroin. But anyway, in Utah, our, our grazing season, I'm going to use up my time here if I don't careful, uh, it's 365 days. If we stockpile grass, we, we're our growing season rights from April, May, June into July, and then it gets hot and dry, and cool season grasses go dormant. And we get some rain in the fall, they'll green up again. But we stockpile, we, we get off them fields in March, April, May, and let them grow, and come back to them in the fall when we come off the ranges in the summer. And I appreciate the fact that we can graze them with a reduction in the feed uh, on them CRP acres. But the, the request that I'm making today is, is give the producer the option to use his 90-day window, whether it be November, December of this year, of the calendar year or January, February into March, the grass is still there, still dormant. We'll have some snow on it, but as long as we can graze, we can still be grazing it now and doing maintenance, not on the same acres, of course, but to rotate them acres and use this field this year and one of next year, or use this one in November, December, and move to another one, another farm, January, February. So I'd like to graze them acres at the producer's option anytime it's dormant and I absolutely stay outside the nesting season. I, I respect that. We went through that battle before. Stay out of the nesting season. Let us graze it for maintenance. Pay the reduction anytime that it's, I say, convenient or more conducive to our operation. And thank you and thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate you coming all the way from Utah and it's good to get some comments from ranchers. All right. Call me if you need me. I'll be back. <laughs> appreciate that. Does anyone else have any comments on uh, crop insurance? We have a lot of the time to 1030, but we can, we can have early. Martin, did you have any, any further comments or? I would just say, I appreciate all the comments. You know, it's very difficult sitting here to understand. Is that better? Yeah. Um, we were concerned about how sensitive they were to start with, so I didn't want to blast everybody. <laughs> Uh, you know, I just want to say that we appreciate the comments. It's, it's highly critical that we understand how these policies that we do affect, affect producers, affect their communities. You know, we look at it as, from the crop insurance perspective, I look at it as, as it's important in a, it's not just, we're not just insuring that producer, we're insuring his community because if he can't pay his bills, then it affects a lot of people in his community. We, we think that's highly important and want to keep continuing to expand our programs. And, and as we've heard here, there's there's been a push to, to expand to smaller producers and we're working on that there's a lot of things we're doing the the dual purpose wheat thing we that was in the farm bill and, and Tim I don't know where you went but we've I think that's already being taken care of so I just I appreciate all the comments and, and the opportunity to be here and listen and you know I hope you know there's still some days left to, to submit comments till March 1st is that right mm -hmm. Sean so you know those of us those of you who are listening we do uh, hope you continue to put comments in and that will help us develop the regulations to 
to make these programs fit your needs as well as we can. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. And just a reminder, you know, Martin mentioned the deadline for submitted comments. You can always write to us on farmers.gov on that website because we definitely want to hear from people around the country what you think about our programs and how we can improve them. So we're going to wrap up early. We're kind of ahead of schedule, which is, which is not a bad thing. Um, but I am going to welcome to the stage now uh, Richard Fordyce and the team from FSA are going to come up here. Thank you again, RMA team. Okay, so the next area today we're going to cover is, uh, is several programs that fall under the Farm Service Agency, ARC PLC, Disaster Programs, Marketing Assistance Loans, and uh, Program Eligibility. I'm going to welcome up here Richard Fordyce. He's the former director of the Missouri Department of Agriculture, and now he's USDA's Farm Service Agency Administrator, and he's going to be here to listen to any feedback folks may have on some of these Farm Service Agency programs, and I'm going to let him share a few words and uh, introduce his team on stage here. Richard? All right, very good. Thank you, Sean. Good morning, everyone. A little bit of a lull here. So uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. There we go. We want to be able to make sure you're, you're all awake and energized to provide comments as it relates to Farm Service Agency. Um, Sean said, uh, my name is Richard Fordyce, and I'm the administrator of the Farm Service Agency. My story is pretty similar to, uh, to Martin's. Um, uh, corn, soybean, and cattle farmer from Northwest Missouri, um, and I too have uh, maybe not in ex this exact setting, but I've provided testimony um, in the past uh, in in the development of farm bills, um, in um, in providing comments um, during uh, reg writing and those kind of things, uh, representing uh, Farm Bureau and the soybean industry uh, over a number of years. Well, I want to. Again, say good morning and welcome to USDA. Uh, welcome to the Jefferson Auditorium. This, um, um, this is an important part of, of the implementation of the Farm Bill. And I think the Undersecretary said it very well. Congress, uh, Congress did a, a, a very nice job in putting together a Farm Bill with bipartisan support. Um, really, I think um, if you look at past Farm Bills, was passed um, was passed very timely. And uh, that's important. That's important for agricultural producers uh, across the country, um, whether, whether you operate a farm or a ranch, you're a forest steward, a uh, corn grower, or especially crop grower, whatever, whatever the case is, um, it's very important that, we, that we, have, we have this legislation passed timely. I wanted to, uh, um, to give you just a little bit uh, of an update about where we are at Farm Service Agency. Uh, our staff have, have done a side-by-side -side comparison looking at legislation from the 2014 Farm Bill and how uh, the provisions in the new Act have changed and have done that side-by-side -side comparison. Um, we've had some preliminary work done. Uh, we've asked uh, teams to come in from the field to start work on, uh, on some, of those, uh, some of those provisions that we, know we need to, that we know we need to get started on and also um, looking at what are the discretionary decisions that we have to make as it relates um, to the new Farm Bill. Um, while this Farm Bill doesn't have any really new from the ground up programs, there are existing programs that have new and improved changes, whether that be ARC PLC, dairy margin coverage, CRP, and even higher lending limits for farm loan programs. Um, these are just a few examples of, of the things that we're working on every day. Um, we want to hear what you have to say as we work through the day. And the Undersecretary said again that this is, this is an opportunity for our external stakeholders, you all, to provide input as it relates to the things that we're doing in Farm Service Agency. Um, we have appropriate staff uh, in the room that are taking notes, um, that are here in the auditorium and also remotely. Uh, that will be taking notes and listening very intently. Um, and I can't, uh, I can't uh, not mention uh, our over 10,000 uh, folks scattered across the country 
in over 2,100 county offices that ultimately will administer these programs. And I'm awfully proud of this group. I'm awfully proud of our entire team, but I'm awfully proud of our group of uh, folks in the field um, that work very passionately to deliver these programs, um, whether, uh, whether they're on the farm program side or the farm loan side, that, um, that, that go to work every day representing and supporting their communities and their farmers. They're a great, they're a great group of folks. Um, they not only take pride in, in delivering these programs, they take pride in their communities, they take pride in the producers. And, and so often when I travel and visit with our folks in the field, they refer to the farmers and ranchers as their farmers and ranchers. So I think that's, I think that's really important. Um, we've said it a couple of times, and, and um, I'll just reiterate, this is a listening session, and we will be listening intently. However, we're not able to provide comments uh, back today, but, um, but certainly welcome uh, welcome those comments um, because we are doing, in my mind, um, across USDA, but, 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 but specifically today um, within the FPAC mission area, we are providing meaningful services across really important communities uh, across rural America every day. And your input is, is, is very valuable and we, we really want to hear it. And so we'll go ahead and get started. But before we do, I want to introduce um, the folks uh, on our team that are at the table today. Um, Acting Associate Administrator uh, Steve Peterson, um, uh, immediate, to my immediate left. Um, Assistant Deputy Administrator Farm Programs, Brad Carmen and our Deputy Administrator for Farm Programs, Bill Beam. So, um, so we're ready to listen. So if you want to, as Sean indicated, come on down to the mics and, and we'll get started. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you, Richard. I see some folks uh, moving down to ask a question or two. And as uh, Richard said, we are here to do a lot of listening today and we wanna hear some input you have. So we will take some questions now to hear about some of these uh, your thoughts on some of the FSA programs the the topics we're going to cover for the next uh, hour or so ARC PLC disaster programs marketing assistant loads and program eligibility I'm going to start right here with you sir good morning my name is Matt Perdue and I'm the government relations director at National Farmers Union on behalf of NFU's nearly 200,000 family farmer rancher and rural members thank you for your commitment to quickly implementing the 2018 farm bill Family farmers and ranchers increasingly find themselves in financial stress as a slump in commodity prices persists. The 2018 Farm Bill provides a number of, number of improvements to the farm safety net. The bill is a meaningful step toward providing producers the support they need to weather these challenging times. NFU's top priority is ensuring that producers have the information they need to take full advantage of opportunities for increased support. The new effective reference price will, in the long term, provide higher levels of support when commodity prices increase. While significant impacts are not expected for several years, payment rates are already expected to increase for a handful of commodities in 2019. We urge FSA to publish payment rates for the agricultural risk coverage and price loss coverage programs as soon as possible. This will allow producers to make an educated decision regarding their program election for the 2019 and 2020 crop years. Another option that will allow producers, some, some producers to receive improved coverage is the opportunity to update their payment yields beginning with the 2020 crop year. FSA should develop an outreach plan to clearly communicate this one-time opportunity to producers well ahead of the 2020 crop year. We also urge FSA to collaborate with RMA and appropriate partners to update and maintain existing decision tools to help producers make informed choices about enrollment in ARC and PLC. These tools will be increasingly important for ARC and PLC when effective reference prices have more significant impacts on payment rates and when producers can make an annual election between the programs beginning in 2021. The dairy economy has been hit particularly hard over the last four years as oversupply has driven prices well below the cost of production. The Farm Bill allows producers to receive a credit or a refund of their net premiums paid into the Margin Protection Program Given the severity of the financial pain producers have endured, we encourage you to promptly inform producers of the amounts they will be entitled to under the credit or refund options. The new Dairy Margin Coverage Program provides producers with opportunities to purchase higher levels of coverage than what was offered under the MPP. Given those new options under the program, 
We encourage FSA to use some of the funds provided for implementation to update the existing dairy decision tool. This will help producers navigate the various coverage levels, coverage percentages, and premium discounts available. We also believe that DMC participants should be granted the option for current year premiums to be deducted before indemnity payments are made. The elimination of the restriction on participation in both the DMC and the Livestock Gross Margin Dairy Program provides dairy producers with yet another important option. We urge FSA to coordinate with RMA in communicating the opportunity for producers to enroll the same production in both programs. As you move forward with the implementation of these various provisions, it is critically important that FSA staffing levels are increased to historical levels. According to the department's 2019 budget, full-time employee equivalents were cut from roughly 11,500 to about 9,200. This has left many county FSA offices overwhelmed, a situation that will become of increasing concern as producers begin to navigate decisions regarding changes to ARC, PLC, and the DMC. We urge the agency to move quickly in filling vacant positions and to increase overall staff levels after years of cuts. NFU has several additional priorities for implementation of the various provisions of the new Farm Bill affecting FSA, RMA, and NRCS programs. Included among these are the effective implementation of the Soil Health and Income Protection Pilot Program, streamlining of whole farm revenue protection reporting requirements, and changes to the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and the Conservation Stewardship Program. We will provide robust feedback for each program in our written comments and look forward to working with each agency as you fully implement these changes. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. We look forward to submitting our written recommendations and working with you throughout the implementation process. Thank you, appreciate that. A lot of topics there, very important to the family farms. Hello again. Hello again. I'm Cindy Ayers, and to Mr. Ford Ice and to the others that's here, again, I come to speak to you on behalf of the small farmers throughout this nation, especially speaking for footprint farms, farmers in Jackson, Mississippi, and the Mississippi cooperatives. We hope you consider and look again at your microloans. The microloans are put in place, but yet still the paperwork that's asked with that and the collateral or the credit scores that still ask for, even for $50,000, it's as much as I'm asking for your million point two. I ask you to look at that and to go back into the county levels and to give more guidance to the persons that you are speaking with as it relates to these loans. A lot of our small farmers are vegetable farmers. So the, your, the offices do not have the proper training on how to look at our crops versus a row crop I mean, versus rice and the time period that we produce and get in place. I ask you totally to consider, again, looking at how this program is administered as it relates to the credit issue. A lot of small farmers will not have the credit issues, yet you still ask to get turned down by banks. And once we do that, we go back in, and now we are at credit risk. For small farmers throughout this country, that's looking at these microloans as a way to not only begin their farms, but to stabilize their farms. And we're talking about a lot of farmers that's been farming for many years, yet still have not received a loan um, for the microloan. So it is a total need. We are small America, yet still we feed so many people. And we are truly the backbone of these small communities that need help. So I ask you, Mr. Vordice and your crew, to truly look at these concerns as it relates to small farmers. I'm Cindy Ayers, state of Mississippi. I am a small farmer, a real farmer, not one just on paper. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Appreciate that. We go to the other side of the aisle here. Hi, my name is Lorette Pachano. I'm the direct, executive director of the Rural Coalition, and I'm bringing comments on behalf of our organization and several others, including um, Rural Advancement Fund of the National Sharecroppers Fund, Oklahoma Black Historical Research Project, Federation of Southern Cooperatives, and several more. I want to um, speak today um, about program eligibility in particular, and the sections of the Farm Bill that are related to heirs' property. Um, there's a very big gap in serving many of the members of our community who are um, historically underserved farmers primarily around the country. And that relates to the fact that they lack 
clear title or deed to their land because it's held in undivided ownership that you know it was the land of a grandparent or a great grandparent and there's no clear title to the land and that means they can't get a farm number and participate in disaster and other programs we worked extensively with a number of members of Congress including Senator Scott and Senator Jones and the Congressional Black Caucus um, on landmark legislation it's been back and forth to USDA and we urge you to implement it expeditiously um, basically it allows producers to use alternate forms of documentation it connects to the uniform partition of heirs property laws that have been passed in a number of states um, which basically allow um, farmers to get land declared as heirs property and that documentation would become um, one of the forms of documentation that would allow farmers to participate in the program um, and then there are other alternate documentation forms and we're, we'll, we'll be putting extensive comments on how to do that um, as this is implemented um, we understand the handbooks for every one of the programs will need to be updated and it's critically important in places right now suffering from disasters such as the Virgin Islands. Um, there's many, many producers in the Virgin Islands and in Puerto Rico um, and throughout the country who are not able to participate in disaster programs that really, really need it. And um, this will allow them to be protected not only in that program but in the whole other context of programs. The second issue I want to address is um, the whole issue of making sure um, farm service agency programs and all USDA programs are open and accessible to all farmers. And we've worked for over 40 years to um, come up with methods, things like the USDA receipt for service, and also metrics to be able to collect data on participation down to the county level. We worked with National Ag Statistics Service to do um, race, gender, and ethnicity county profiles so we know what the farmers in each place are growing. And there's a civil rights study that's required in the Farm Bill. And we encourage USDA to use that in a proactive manner to kind of get an assessment of which programs are producers participating in, historically underserved producers, which programs are not serving their needs, how would the implementation of the heirs' property laws, um, of the heirs' property um, provisions allow that participation to increase as we remove more barriers. So those are just a few of the areas, and we'll certainly get to other ones we'd like to to see disaster programs simplified. Um, it's also a new day when, you know, the smaller size farmers are producing more products and we're also very anxious to work with you, especially in the NAP program, on how to make sure that all farmers, no matter how small, you know, it might be a couple acres of vegetables, but that's a lot of money to participate in those programs. So we thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Sir. Good morning. My name is Steve Records. I'm a SCORE. Uh, in 2017, the USDA partnered with SCORE to bring business expertise to, to rural entrepreneurs and farmers and ranchers. Uh, SCORE has 11,000 expert business volunteers around the country, and what I'm here to, to do this morning is to share with you some of the data from our first year. It's both good and bad. Uh, first, we've only really implemented this program in partnership within about 17 states, and we have some great successes within Georgia, Maine, Connecticut, Minnesota, but there's still large swaths of the country that we're uh, looking and relying on FSA in, uh, implementation in particular to help us continue to push this partnership out. 24% um, of all of the clients that came to SCORE that were not in business that self-defined themselves in the agriculture industry started a business last year. It's an exceedingly high number. Last year among our clients, um, more than 4,000 total clients came to us self-identified as a farmer or rancher or within the agribusiness. Um, many of them started a business, half of them grew their businesses at an average revenue over $94,000. So we know mentoring works, we know the business training that SCORE can provide works, and we know the ubiquitous nature of where SCORE is in thousands of communities across the country can help. All the data isn't great though. Of the clients that we did talk to, 68% of them said that they had not partaken in a USDA service. So there's a lot of effort and collaboration that still is, is required and exists out there to really 
hit the mark with specifically beginning farmers and ranchers, the support that's needed for them. Uh, and programs like SCORE can certainly help carry that message, connect them to USDA, other parts of the, the FSA, to really help them not only start, but sustain and grow and even exit their farms in a, in a logical manner. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate that. Beginning farm and rancher programs are very important. You can find a lot of that information and tools at farmers.gov as well. Sir, good morning. Thank you very much for holding this uh, field hearing. Uh, my name is Rudy Arredondo. I'm the president of the National Latino Farmers and Ranchers Trade Association, uh, representing over 75,000 Latino farmers and ranchers throughout the United States. Uh, I uh, would like to uh, express the fact that I want to echo the young lady from Mississippi in terms of her comments, uh, particularly on the, on the microloans. It's, we're still having difficulty, and in spite of the fact that there were at least uh, three certified lawsuits to the USDA for discrimination, that still exists in the field. So this, this is something I would request that you look and attempt to uh, create some equity among that. Uh, there's no, you know, there's some, some of the bad actors that created this issue are still in place. In, in uh, one of the things that I, we're concerned about also is in terms of the uh, coordination of disaster assistance by the different agencies, especially USDA, I think it should be, uh, uh, certainly in terms of uh, our, our uh, members, to be able to coordinate with FEMA and the other state agencies that deal with disaster, because it seems like, you know, uh, in Valencia County, in New Mexico, it was a disarray, and this still hasn't been resolved yet. So that is uh, one thing that we would uh, also like to uh, uh, make sure that you are aware of. We have a team in Puerto Rico as a disaster. We, well, fortunately, we have uh, working with us the former administrator, Mr. Juan Garcia, is out there helping to uh, the, the coordinate USDA activities, and uh, we're very pleased with that. Uh, one of the things is, uh, in terms of, you know, the Forest Service infrastructure, you know, we're concerned about the wildfires because that that really creates an issue for us in terms of uh, endangering our, our uh, cattlemen, particularly in northern New Mexico, in the Taos area, where they uh, the grazer, their cattle in, in, the, in the public lands. Uh, the other thing with regard to the, to the uh, ranchers is that some of the Latino farmers, their grazing permits are being pulled so that we have a diminishing uh, number of, of uh, Latino farmers that are uh, being displaced and, and uh, those permits are being handed over to some mainstream folks. So thank you very for holding this and look forward to working with you on resolving some of these issues. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. I see someone walking this way now. We might have a few more comments on some of these FSA programs. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Reese Langley, Vice President for Washington Operations with the National Cotton Council. We represent all segments of the U.S. cotton industry. Uh, while many of the most significant changes to cotton policy were made as part of the Bipartisan Budget Act in 2018, there are still very important provisions for cotton included in the new Farm Bill that we're very focused on. And with respect to ARC and PLC, first of all, we're very grateful to FSA and RMA for the very timely and, guide and clear guidance that was put out yesterday with respect to when producers can purchase stacks crop insurance and when they can enroll their seed cotton base acres in ARC or PLC on an annual basis. So thank both the agencies for getting that guidance out in a timely manner. Secondly, with respect to ARC and PLC payments, we urge FSA to try to make sure that those payments on seed cotton are made as soon as possible after October 1 of each year by ensuring that the market year average prices for seed cotton are determined and finalized in a timely manner. With regard to base acres for seed cotton and CRP, a couple of issues to highlight. One, while a majority of the generic base acres have already been converted to either seed cotton base or other covered commodities or unassigned base, 
there will be additional generic base acres as CRP contracts expire this year and going forward. And it's our understanding that FSA has the ability to uh, convert those acres or make adjustments to base acres on those farms so that that generic base would become seed cotton base going forward or eligible for ARC and PLC. However, there's also going to be generic base acres on farms where the CRP contract expired between 2009 and 2016, which is the time period that was used for determining whether or not there was a planning history on those farms for purposes of seed cotton base. And we would urge FSA to look at that situation and try to consider their considered planning provisions as hopefully allowing those generic base acres that have come out of CRP between 09 and 16 to, to still be considered seed cotton base going forward. With respect to the actively engaged provisions and eligibility provisions of the new Farm Bill, uh, it modified the definition of family member for, pur for purposes of actively engaged in farming requirements. This adjustment in that definition should remove some of the unwarranted and burdensome record keeping requirements and provide significant regulatory relief for what by all other standards are considered family farms. And so we urge that this change can be implemented in time for the 2019 program year. Regarding cotton loan programs, there was an increase in this farm bill in the loan rate for extra long staple or ELS cotton. And part of that change also results in uh, a change in the formula that's used for calculating the ELS competitiveness program and whether or not that program will trigger. Currently, there's a strong and time sensitive need to incorporate price quotes for comparable qualities of cotton of other origins that compete with U.S. ELS cotton in the export market. And so we would strongly urge USDA to work with the industry stakeholders to make those necessary adjustments in the ELS program so that it operates as intended when it was legislated in previous farm bills and now reauthorized in this farm bill. And then finally, with respect to some of the report language that was included in this farm bill, uh, two areas that are very important to the cotton industry. One, there was specific report language that directed USDA on, on the discretionary policy that would allow changes to the cotton storage agreement as well as provider agreements for warehouse receipts in order to help modernize these requirements to improve the timely shipment of cotton to our end users. All segments of the U.S. cotton industry have come to an agreement on these changes and reached consensus and we would urge USDA to make these regulatory changes in time for the 2019 crop year. And then the final point is also in report language the conferees had urged USDA to modify the price quotes that are used in determining the adjusted world price for upland cotton and to use the three lowest foreign price quotes. This change would allow the AWP to more closely reflect the actual prices of other growths of cotton that the U.S. is competing with in our export markets. Thank you for the opportunity to provide these comments and we look forward to working closely with USDA. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We appreciate your comments on items of importance to the cotton industry and uh, some of those touch other spring crops as well. Does anyone else have any further comments this morning on some of the topics we're here on FSA? We're supposed to touch on dairy here in a moment. I think we're going to probably get started early on that. Hopefully we have some folks in the room have some questions about dairy as it relates to FSA programs. Yeah, Sir? hi, uh, Ferd Hefner, National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Uh, I just want to make a brief comment on uh, the actively engaged in payment limitation uh, situation relative to nieces, nephews, and first cousins. Um, it's our opinion uh, that adding additional family members, even beyond that, would be perfectly fine, provided that the agency actually have a real definition for active personal management that would be consistent with the 2015 rule that was promulgated, but applied across the board, regardless of who's involved in the farming operation, that definition should apply across the board. And then, sure, bring in anybody you want to bring in, even beyond the extended family, provided that they're actually actively engaged and meeting an actual verifiable 
management tests. So we urge you to, to do that as you promulgate that rule. Appreciate that. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Mark Rockla on behalf of the Organic Farmers Association. The organic uh, certification cost share program is a, one of the top priorities for our uh, organization. Uh, it helps cover some of the cost of the uh, of additional cost of certification. We've got a couple of requests. Um, we ask that uh, you know, provide training for each county so that the counties understand uh, the program. Also, as we worked with uh, many of you on the panel on reauthorization <coughs> of the Farm Bill, bless you, Brett, um, we, there was a lot of information there uh, that we didn't always seem to understand, so we encourage USDA to have a better understanding of you know, the cost of the program, who's participating, uh, and those type of numbers. And, and again, we would love to, to be part of that process and help, uh, help you make sure that our members understand the program. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Okay, open. we can have a few more comments. We certainly have time. We're running ahead of schedule here. If anyone in the room has questions about FSA programs, we'd kind of like to move on to dairy if anyone has any questions about those topics. I don't see any. Too many people move forward here. Oh, we got somebody. Hello. Good morning, sir. If you tell us your name, please, and sure, good, your organization. Good morning. I'm Paul Bleiberg. I'm Vice President of Government Relations with the National Milk Producers Federation. Thank you for putting this together. Go ahead. Please. please. Well, thank you for holding this session, and uh, we look forward to working with you on the implementation process, and we appreciate the, uh, the priority that the Secretary has put on implementing the dairy program. And I can stand here today and say dairy farmers need this program today more than ever. I come from upstate New York originally, and in the last few years we've had farmers by the dozens go out of business. I think you're going to hear today from other folks too about similar situations in other parts of the country. We represent all of them. So uh, with that in mind, coming off of four years of depressed milk prices, we're here to urge you today to begin the sign up and the implementation of the new program as soon as possible so that farmers can begin to access the new benefits under the dairy margin coverage. I think there was some important language uh, referenced in the committee in the congressional report that went along with the final bill as far as outreach to producers, as far as using multiple means to contact different farmers regardless of who had signed up for the program previously to kind of capture as wide a net as possible. We think that kind of outreach will be critical. We also think it's going to be important for the department to take a flexible approach and looking at some of the different issues that might arise. There are always scenarios that occur on the farm that we can't anticipate sitting here today, whether it relates to how you pay premiums on a certain schedule or, you know, farm intergenerational transfers or things like that. And we just think it's important that the department take a flexible approach that's farmer friendly as the new program comes online. Another important element relates to the producer premium refund from the margin protection program. I think there's a lot of interest in that component in the, uh, in the, in the farm bill as well. And so we would urge that the department work to get information to producers about their refund options very quickly and in tandem with the whole sign up and roll out of the new DMC as much as possible. And in keeping with that, for the for the farmers that select the uh, kind of cash back refund option, we think it's important that they be remitted that cash as soon as possible because there may be producers who are hanging on right now, but we get three or four months from now, they may not be able to, to go any longer. And some of this stuff may make the difference as far as producers' long-term viability. So the, the broad array of changes made to the dairy margin coverage program in the statute, I think, reflect the desire on the part of Congress for there to be flexibility for producers to have options. And I think our broad ask, in addition to uh, starting the implementation quickly, and we appreciate the Secretary's commitment to prioritize dairy, but our broad ask is really to do it in a farmer-friendly, flexible manner that captures as many folks as possible. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. We always look to make our programs more customer-friendly. Over here, sir. Good, Good morning. morning. I'm Steve Etko with uh, the Midwest Dairy Coalition. Uh, Midwest Dairy Coalition is an alliance of farmer-owned dairy cooperatives with members throughout the Midwest, particularly the upper Midwest, who have joined together to advocate for federal dairy policy issues. Uh, I wanted to associate my comments with my colleagues from National Milk and previously from National Farmers Union as well. As you've heard, the U.S. dairy economy is in the worst shape it's been in many, many decades. And we're entering the fifth straight year of milk prices below cost of production. Uh, on February 21st, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel ran a detailed article about the plight of dairy farmers in Wisconsin. 
entitled Dairy Farmers Are in Crisis and It Could Change Wisconsin Forever. I'm going to submit the link to that article in the written comments that I submit later. Uh, the new Farm Bill created the Dairy Margin Coverage Program, which we believe will be a significant improve, uh, significantly improved safety net for dairy farmers across the country. But with dairy farmers going out of business daily in the Upper Midwest, it's really critical that you prioritize the sign up for this program and get it up and running as soon as possible. In addition, since dairy farmers have absolutely no cash to spare right now, I would urge you to be as flexible as possible in the timing for paying the premiums for those who sign up for the program in 2019 and beyond. It would be completely counterproductive if dairy farmers can't sign up for the new DMC program because they don't have the cash up front to pay premiums. So allowing premiums to, pay, to be paid later in the year or to be, uh, give farmers the option of paying those premiums from their indemnities would be extremely helpful. For those farmers who choose to take the advantage of the 25% premium discount for locking in their DMC uh, percentage coverage and buy-up levels for five years, we urge you to allow those premiums to be paid annually instead of requiring premium payments in, up front for the full five years of the premiums. Uh, lastly, in recognition that the dairy uh, program that was established in the 2014 Farm Bill, the Margin Protection Program, was completely inadequate. Congress included provisions in the new Farm Bill to allow dairy farmers who participated in that program to have a partial refund on their premiums from 2014 through 17, either 50% uh, refund in cash up front or 75% refund as a credit toward future premiums if they sign up for the new DMC program at their choice. Even though the refund will be higher if taken as a credit toward future DMC premiums, we know that many farmers may choose the upfront cash option because of the severity of their financial situation right now. So uh, it's critical that USDA communicate to those farmers, ASCP, about how much of a refund they are eligible to receive and to expedite those checks for those farmers choosing the cash refund. So thanks in advance for your efforts to prioritize and expedite the DMC program implementation and the MPP refund. Uh, procedures and checks. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. All right, we have a comment over here. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Administrator Forsyth, the team. Uh, my name is Jaime Castaneda. I'm a senior policy, stra senior vice president for policy strategy for the National Milk Producers Federation. I want to echo just my uh, comments of my predecessors, my colleague uh, Paul Weiberg and Steve Etka. What I want to just add is a couple of uh, elements that are very important. One is, uh, again, uh, the implementation. You have heard uh, the Secretary is uh, testifying before Congress. I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of questions in, in reference of how soon we can do this and perfectly understand that there is a number of hurdles and obstacles that have to be. And for, to that point, uh, we want to thank you uh, so much uh, to you and your team for the excellent work that you're already doing. Uh, we sincerely appreciate uh, all the efforts that are going into trying to do this implementation as soon as possible. If we, try, if we can help you with anything, uh, we want to, to offer that, that help. Um, also, as we implement this new program, as you know, Congress uh, indicated to NAS uh, that they should actually start collecting and passing that information to uh, FSA on dairy uh, hay quality. Uh, this is very important to be included in the uh, feed ration in the, in, in, as part of the, the margin uh, uh, program, at, at the, the dairy uh, margin coverage. So, so this is actually very essential as we move forward. Uh, my understanding is that NAS is actually uh, is collecting this information and, and I'm sure that they're going to work very closely with you as, as you move forward. Uh, the other element that has been touched, but I want you to put emphasis on it, is that there will be uh, a lot of producers that were uh, disenfranchised, uh, uh, were unhappy with the previous program. 
and even though they register uh, originally for MPP, then they, they stop uh, being part of that program. Uh, since then, uh, their operations may have changed. Their operations may have included uh, new members of their family or others. We encourage you to be flexible. There is a lot of producers that have been uh, small, that they're still under five billion pounds, five million pounds of, of milk, that they will would like to actually be able to take advantage of this program. Encourage you to try to be as flexible as possible. We can bring you case after case, but it is going to be that these farmers are going to go to your FSA field offices are going to be presenting, and in many cases, those field offices may or may not know how to react to them. So, so this is specific cases. I can assure you there's going to be hundreds of uh, unique uh, situations, and I encourage you to look at, uh, at every one of them and proceed as, as, as farmer-friendly as possible, and the great customer service that you already are, are, are putting forward with you and your team. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Han. Appreciate that. Ma'am? Yes. Um, Got to adjust a little. Um, good morning, and I thank USDA for having um, this session. My name is Savvy Horn. I'm with the North Carolina Association of Black Lawyers Land Loss Prevention Project, and we've been providing direct assistance and technical assistance to farmers, uh, limited resource farmers in the state of North Carolina for over 35 years, and we work across the southeastern region collaboratively with organizations such as Federation of Southern Cooperatives, the Rural Coalition, and nationally with, as well with National Family Farms. So I just want to say, um, because it really bears heavily on my heart this morning, and um, so I just want to speak to this factor, and, and it's the way in which suicide is really impacting our, our farmers. Um, just a day ago, a farmer from the Virgin Islands was laid to rest as a result of suicide, and that was the second one after the hurricanes. And there are more, you know, coming from dairy farmers and elsewhere. And we do have this new program. I don't know where it's going to land in whose portfolio, but I would just like to comment that the uh, stress assistance program needs to take into account particular conditions of people. So it needs to be around, say, African American farmers and their unique stressors in designing the program and implementing a network, small island stressors in which, you know, they're sort of kind of outside of our main agricultural system, but there's always the stress of being isolated on an island and dealing with the force of nature as well. So um, I think the program could be very creatively designed to meet the needs of many. Um, different type of agriculturalists and where, where they grow. And um, as an organization and others, we would like to be part of that process because we've been concerned about the mental health of farmers. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you talking about that subject. Also for coming up here from North Carolina. Do we have any other comments today? On Farm Service Assistance. We're going to touch on some credit and farm loans, I believe, after lunch today, but... Okay, we're going to touch on those now. We're so far ahead of schedule here. Uh, yeah, we'll also take questions on those if you have questions on credit loans and that sort of thing. We have, uh, we have the subject matter experts right here. Any questions on ARC PLC, disaster programs, marketing assistant loans, program eligibility, dairy, credit, or farm loan programs? Anyone in the audience? Oh, we have, well, we do have a comment here. You look awful familiar to me. 
Hi, Sean. How are you? Good. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here today and, and for this opportunity um, to share some comments with you. My name is Erin Foster West. I am the Federal Policy Director for the National Young Farmers Coalition. We are a national advocacy network of young farmers um, with 42 farmer-led chapters across the country um, and wanted to share a little bit with you um, on the challenges of accessing capital and credit for young farmers. This is one of the top issues right now affecting current and aspiring young farmers and they cite this as one of their biggest barriers to being successful. The FSA loan programs are really critical for young and beginning farmers and often the only credit option that's available to them. Often young farmers are coming in with thousands of dollars of student debt um, and are denied loans from those traditional lenders. So we are really excited to see and the Farm Bill provisions um, the new loan guarantees for 95% of the outstanding principal for socially disadvantaged farmers and beginning farmers and we're excited to work with you all on implementing those provisions. Um, we have a couple thoughts on how you could continue to enhance participation in those guaranteed loan programs. Um, so we've got a few more recommendations. Um, please ensure that there is clear, consistent, and timely public reporting on the recipients of the guaranteed loan programs. This should include demographic data like age, farm size, gender, ethnicity, and race as in um, the provision in the 2018 Farm Bill. Current reporting, it can be difficult sometimes um, to see the number and proportion of guaranteed loans that are going um, to those populations. Um, and make sure that that reporting is disaggregated on the number and proportions of loans being made to the historically underserved groups. So be clear the loans going to beginning farmers, women farmers, farmers of color, veteran farmers, and, and other groups. And ensure that that disaggregated data is also publicly available. Um, currently, bars are grouped together under socially disadvantaged applicants, so it can be difficult to know um, who those loans are going to um, and who are not being able to access guaranteed um, financing. With more and better data available, lenders can then do more targeting and effective outreach plans to ensure they reach participation targets and can then demonstrate improvements um, as those outreach plans are successful. So guaranteed lenders, we think, should be submitting those outreach plans to USDA um, to be clear how they're going to be reaching beginning and socially disadvantaged producers as well as other underserved producers and make sure that those plans are culturally appropriate for those populations um, and build in some account accountability measures um, so that they're reporting back to USDA on implement how they're implementing those outreach plans. To assist with the outreach, um, we think the FSA should be working closely with the guaranteed lenders so they can coordinate on those outreach activities as well as their participation rate tracking um, so institutions can share lessons learned, coordinate on outreach um, where that's possible and appropriate. Lastly, um, please provide some incentives to lenders to encourage that they have a diverse lending staff that reflects the diversity of underserved borrowers. We would encourage you to work with Farm Credit Administration um, to encourage that lenders are recruiting staff from the 1890 historically black land group universities, the 94 land grant universities, and historically, or excuse me, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities um, and other similar institutions. So look forward to working with you on this, and thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you, Aaron. We appreciate your comments. We have, a, we have another comment here. Yes, on an upbeat note, mm -hmm. an opportunity. Um, so um, as an organization, um, really our historical footprint was based on the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Program. And part of that was uh, the work around credit and access to credit and access to resources to relend. Under the heirs' property um, provision, there is an FSA piece on developing a relending program. So we would like to continue to provide comments on that section, but also would like FSA to quickly implement this section because I think it's critically important that uh, in states where you have access to uh, go into court and begin this process, which we find is much more equitable under the Uniform Partition Act, that there be 
resources available to assist families as they move through that process monetarily to get the kind of legal work that they need uh, to clear title and access USDA program. So with the pilot programs, we really think you need at least three of them. You need reporting. But I also think this might be a creative moment um, for uh, USDA to kind of look at, um, say, for example, African American community financial institutions who have since moved from farm credit and dealing with uh, ag lending, but are more situated in the consumer um, home loan of maybe developing some kind of hybrid model of an advisory body for an, you know, for, to advise, uh, you know, a program that has a proven track record in, say, mortgage lending to augment that program to deal with, um, you know, ag loans as well as access to a relenting program of this nature. I think it's a little bit out of the box, but what I'm, when I look across um, and scan um, community development financial institutions, I am not seeing that ag piece necessarily. So I think we have to be in a very creative process of how to land that program and to make sure there is participation on behalf of African American financial institutions in this field. So um, that's my recommendation and we'll send other comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Two great comments. Thank you. Appreciate those. Yeah, we're, we're going to ask uh, Bill Cobb to come up to the stage at this time. Uh, we're talking about some of these. Uh, if you'll uh, bear with me one moment, sir, we're just bringing someone else up on, on stage here. And address our credit and farm loans. And again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to come on up and just queue. All right. Yes, uh, maybe you could introduce them. Thanks, Sean. We are um, we're moving through um, uh, moving through the different segments uh, a little quicker than we'd anticipated. So uh, we've asked Bill Cobb um, to come to the stage. Bill is the acting uh, deputy administrator for farm loan programs. Um, he also has with him Craig Nels, um, uh, Courtney Dixon, and Dana Ritchie. Also with farm loan programs are in the room as well. And I failed to mention a couple of. Uh, division directors under farm programs, um, Kim Graham and Danny Cook, were in are in are in the room um, right now and have heard all the comments previous to this. And the two comments, so the folks, the two folks that gave remarks on farm credit, um, Bill was in the room. We just didn't have him up on the stage yet. So, um, so we're going to get started again uh, on the farm credit line. So, thank you all very much. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate that. I just uh, really have I'm sorry, one more time. Can we get your name and organization? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one concern that I have that uh, I forgot to bring up is the language capability in terms of Spanish speaking in some of the areas in which we work, you don't have uh, bilingual capacity. And so I would like to uh, alert you to the, to the fact that, you know, we would like to be able to help you but we, you know, we can't do it all alone, and uh, we would be very good to have that capacity in those areas in which there's a large number of Latino farmers and ranchers who, I mean, it's very difficult even for those of us that speak English to be able to understand some of the USDA processes and so forth, but it, it's even uh, harder for some of those that have a language, uh, uh, you know, uh, not as, as, as uh, uh, well, in English. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to probably wrap up a little early in about 10. Please, come on down. We still, we still have a little time here. Good morning. Good morning. I am Monica Range, Director of Land Retention and Advocacy for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. On behalf of the 20,000 families and, and farm families and members that we represent across seven southern states, we want to applaud this 2018 Farm Bill 
The Federation since two, 1967 has had the opportunity to work with the largest group of black farmers and communities of color across the South. And at a time when many farmers are facing issues such as depressed prices, um, access to markets, and a widening farm crisis, African American farmers especially are hurting because of one issue in particular. That issue is the issue of heirs' property. You see, many black farmers farm on land that's been passed down to them from generations before, and that's a, both a blessing and a curse, because heirs' property limits their ability to access many of the USDA programs that are in place. We applaud this farm bill because it recognizes that challenge to accessing many of the farm USDA programs. So the fair access for farmers and ranchers inclusion into this farm bill is going to be a game changer. We believe the fact that the secretary will be able to implement the provisions of that bill, which include allowing additional documentation for those farmers to qualify for many of the loan, conservation, and commodity programs, will allow farmers to create more viability on their farms and become more economically sustainable. Today we realize that only 2% of America's farmers are farmers of color. And we realize that this is a growing tragedy because these farmers are struggling to stay on the land. And the mission of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives has always been to help focus on keeping black farmers on the land. So we believe these provisions will be a game changer because of the focus on the relending of, of monies which will be used to allow them to resolve heirs' property issues. We urge the secretary to fully implement um, the relending by asking and requesting the full $10 million to make these funds available for farmers to start resolving these heirs' property issues immediately. We also believe that the study that has been commissioned in this farm bill is going to be an important part of understanding what the heirs' property problem really is, the size of it. To this date, there is no comprehensive study which would allow us to determine what land tenure trends have been for African American farmers. So we, uh, we applaud the fact that the Secretary is going to urgently look at this issue. Now I want to switch hats for just a second because our organization also works with the, the state agricultural mediation programs in Georgia, Louisiana, and uh, currently in Mississippi. The, this program has been vital to all farmers as it relates to farmers being able to utilize an administrative process to resolve disputes that they may have with the USDA. Unfortunately, despite the successes of this program and its, its great implementation, the program is fraught with some issues of concern I do want to bring to the Secretary's attention. One in particular is that the Farm Bill now increases the number of covered cases allowed by the agri State Agricultural Mediation Program. Those, that increase is now going to include issues such as farm transitions, which we believe may help us to resolve some of the heirs' property issues. One of the recurring problems is that we, we face a delay in payment. Many of these state programs uh, start the program October 1, but are not, uh, don't receive payment until late December. So we want to request that the Secretary immediately look into efficiently and effectively funding this program in a timely manner. Thank you so much for the time, and we appreciate the opportunity to address these issues. Okay. Thank you, Monica. We appreciate that. We have another comment here. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Julie Obadzinski. I'm the Interim Policy Director with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Um, first, I want to thank USDA for the opportunity to present comments today on the Farm Bill. Um, I'm going to focus most of my comments today on the farm credit programs. Um, I would like to start with a question regarding uh, what additional programmatic changes FSA should consider specifically to increase participation by socially disadvantaged and beginning farmers. While the new Farm Bill includes changes to farm loan programs, it's important to know that the real impact of these changes is not yet known. For example, the Farm Bill increases 
the maximum loan amount for both direct and guaranteed loans. And while this change will increase access to credit for some, presumably larger operations, um, it may very well adversely impact credit for others, which include current FSA borrowers and new farmers. In that like, light, I have four primary recommendations. First, USDA should closely monitor and report on lending trends and beginning this year to ensure that small and mid-sized family farms, new and beginning, socially disadvantaged, and veteran farmers are able to access credit at rates similar to those under previous loan limits, so prior to passage of the 2018 Farm Bill. The new Farm Bill establishes annual public reporting requirements on lending trends to ensure close monitoring and potentially mitigation, if needed, of any negative impacts that the higher loan limits may have. Um, and while FSA currently provides some annual and state-level data, uh, there is very little longer-term analysis of year-to-year -year lending trends. Given the potential serious impact that an increase in loan caps may have, um, specifically on the next generation of farmers, we strongly encourage USDA to prioritize more robust reporting and monitoring of loan programs going forward starting this year. Relatedly, we believe USDA should conduct more robust analysis and reporting comparing lending trends specifically with target participation rates for beginning and socially disadvantaged farmers. We urge USDA to move forward with a comprehensive review of FSA loan programs that was established in Section 5413 of the new Farm Bill. Um, this would include an analysis of target annual participation rates um, and specific actions or recommendations to improve lending to these communities. Uh, while these lending goals are well established, we do agree with Congress that there needs to be more transparency and accountability with regard to actually meeting these targets. Thirdly, um, if lending trends do indicate decreased lending to small and mid-sized farmers, beginning farmers and socially disadvantaged farmers, USDA should take immediate action to increase lending to these communities in future years. Given increased loan limits and the anticipated increase in demand for a limited pool of FSA loan funding, we believe that USDA must take a proactive role to ensure that FSA loan programs remain accessible for these farmers, especially those that are current borrowers and new farmers. Um, and this is especially in light of FY19 lending trends if they indicate that a shortfall um, is, in, is in sight. USDA should also take immediate steps to fill the state beginning farmer coordinator positions that were established in the new Farm Bill and charge them specifically with developing state-specific outreach plans to target the unique credit needs of beginning farmers. In addition to creating effective strategies for targeted outreach and technical assistance, FSA should also partner with organizations on the ground who work with these communities. Um, and this would include developing meaningful and effective strategies to get these farmers into credit programs. We also urge USDA to move forward quickly in rolling out the new Farming Opportunities Training and Outreach Program. This is administered jointly by the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And we would encourage FSA to work closely with those agencies in providing outreach and training to underserved farmers. Finally, USDA should establish stricter requirements to ensure that guaranteed lenders are making progress in meeting statutory target participation rates for beginning and socially disadvantaged farmers. To date, most st statutory target participation rates for these farmers are not being met across all loan programs, with guaranteed lenders performing the most poorly. All guaranteed lenders should at a minimum be required to develop an outreach plan that details specific actions and strategies to effectively reach underserved communities along with documentation that the outreach efforts were actually conducted. Given the ever important role that FSA loans play in the farm safety net, the time is right for USDA to approach these lending targets in a more meaningful way that does not simply allow lenders to fail year after year without penalty. In closing, I'd like to thank, thank you for the opportunity to comment, and I do want to note that we will be submitting more detailed recommendations in, in writing. Thank you. Okay. All right, Julie, thank you. Four suggestions we'll look at. To farm credit and targeted outreach. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Lorette Pachano again with um, Rural Coalition and um, all our allies um, and members. Um, 
I wanted to talk again about the relending program under Ayers Property and also why this issue is so important, um, a little bit in context for FSA and USDA to implement. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, um, one of the things that was noticed is that in certain areas, um, people living in houses were ineligible for um, FEMA and flood insurance and therefore not able to repair properties because they lacked the direct title to their land of the people that were actually living there. You know, there were many heirs to the property. And as a result of that, there was an effort, and I think like the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta noticed the implications on everybody's um, property values when you have a lot of unrepaired um, properties. And that's why we keep saying this is such a critical issue. So as a result of that, there was a design of a uniform partition of heirs property law that my colleagues have also mentioned um, that basically gives rights to the families. Right now, if, you, if a, somebody operating on heirs property wants to participate in the USDA program, you have to get 100% of the owners to sign up and give documentation. That's a very arduous process. So what's happened, and you know, as um, you know, especially the Federation of Southern Cooperatives has shown us, up to 40% um, of the land in certain areas might be ineligible. And that also means that land is not available to be passed on to the next generation of farmers. The wealth is not passed on. So the new tools that we've provided, you know, allow some alternate needs to do this. And the relending fund is particularly important. Um, we went back and forth, you know, the Senate Agriculture Committee worked, you know, very, very closely with USDA. We worked with the Uniform Laws Commission. It's a carefully crafted law that also we use the authority under the pilot program um, on, in, under the credit title because what it allows is lending to community development finance institutions um, to allow them to work with the farmers and ranchers and work with the families. And so what you need to do is put together a package to preserve the rights of the heirs that are not there, but also to help protect the farmer and then to allow the farm, the people who are currently cultivating the land to qualify for USDA disaster programs, um, credit programs, and so forth. This is especially important in areas with disasters because once again, you're looking at the, t the at the land area and you know what it, what are the property values for everybody. So that's the reason that we keep saying this is incredibly important, and um, we really ask that it um, that it you know it be done. And then finally, we also want to echo the comments on um, the Farm Credit Administration and what the processes are, and you know really doing that data. The the national the heirs property. Um, it authorizes a study of land tenure by the National Ag Statistics Service. And this is really important for USDA, for FSA, to know how many properties are in undivided interest, how many of them are in different structures of tenure. And you know, really to get down to the county level to look at who's participating, who's not participating, what's happening to the land values, with the level of disasters that we're having, you know, that also affects credit. And it affects, you know, all the things we worked in 1987 to get the first um, definition of historically underserved, socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. And we're here still to work with you on how do we use these tools to improve the programs, to improve the service, and you know, also to get the farm credit system to use those same tools to make sure that credit goes to everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't know if we have uh, any further comments. We might end up breaking early for lunch. In fact, I think we're gonna do that. So we're gonna meet back here. What are we gonna meet back here? 12.30? Okay, so we are gonna take a uh, quick break, just to kind of some reminders on housekeeping notes, especially if you just came in the bathroom. It's on wing five. Just go out here and onto wing five. Uh, the cafeteria is, is in wing three. And they have some, uh, some excellent service out there. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Richard maybe real quick. Did you have any parting words you'd like to give? To sure. Thank you, Sean. Um, again, thank you. <coughs> Sorry.
Um, thank you all very much for, um, for your participation uh, in this segment of the listening session. Um, as Sean indicated, we'll be back after lunch um, to, talk, uh, to talk more uh, about conservation. Um, I would say that uh, a lot of the comments that, that we've received uh, are on topics and issues that we're currently working on. And, and we certainly will take, um, take the comments that you've provided this morning um, and, and work with those as we uh, continue uh, implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, very meaningful comments. I do appreciate, uh, do appreciate you being here. I appreciate, um, I appreciate the, um, the willingness uh, for you all to, to come up and come to the mic and offer remarks. Sometimes, that's, uh, sometimes that can be difficult, and, um, but I can tell that uh, depending on what, what area you represent and what, uh, what part of the discussion this morning that you're passionate about, um, you've done an amazing job, and we appreciate that very much. Um, I'm guessing we're a little ahead of schedule, um, so I'm guessing that we might revisit some of these topics um, after lunch. So if you have colleagues or others that uh, we're anticipating a start time for, for a certain segment, that we'll, um, we'll kind of recircle and, and, and give folks an opportunity when we come back after lunch. So um, thank you all very much. And uh, we, we, I've, I've, got, I've got four pages of notes. My hand is cramping. So, um, so we are, we're, we're definitely listening. Um, and again, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, for you all to come in. Thank you. All right, thanks. We're going to break for lunch. And uh, as Richard said, there'll be time for general comments as well if you didn't have the opportunity earlier. So we will see you back here at 1230. We'll talk about conservation this afternoon and customer service.
All right. Well, welcome back. If you're uh, just arriving here this afternoon, welcome to USDA headquarters right here on the National Mall in our Farm Bill listening session. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to touch on items uh, related to conservation. We're also going to take some general comments, and we want to hear your thoughts on customer service, which is the big top priority right here at USDA. We had uh, tons of registrations through the website, well over 900, and thank you all for coming out here. Uh, we're going to touch on some of those notes but, that I just mentioned, but we're going to take the uh, first 30 minutes to kind of cover down on any items that we discussed this morning. Uh, lots of you may have, may have come late. We, we got way ahead of the game, so we have a little extra time to address some of those issues related to FSA, farm credit, loans, uh, crop insurance. So uh, if anyone has any of those questions, you can uh, start coming up here. We've got two aisles with two microphones. You just need to line up uh, right at the first row of chairs. Uh, I'll just go over some ha housekeeping items real quickly. Wing 5 is where you'll find the restrooms. Uh, wing 3 is the cafeteria. You can also watch uh, this session in the back of the cafeteria. And we have a press room across the hall in room 1079. So we'll get underway here. If anyone has any questions related to any of the items this morning, I'd like to ask you to come forward now and maybe we can address some of those. We have leadership here from the Risk Management Agency, the Farm Service Agency. All right. Going once, going twice. Okay. And if anyone comes back later and has questions about those items, we're going to cover those at, uh, at 4 p.m. this afternoon. Uh, so with that, we will move, move on to conservation. So I will ask our chief of NRCS to please come up here. All right, and another reminder, you can always submit comments at farmers.gov on, on any of the USDA programs. We certainly want to hear from you uh, on how we can improve those things. So with us to listen to your comments this afternoon on conservation, we have Matt Lohr, formerly Virginia's Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services. He is now the Chief here at USDA's Natural Resources and Conservation Service. He has a few words, and he's going to introduce some of the team on stage here. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Lohr, and I have the great pleasure of serving as a chief here at NRCS. And I, I come to this job as a way of being a fifth-generation farmer from Virginia. So conservation has certainly been very passionate to me throughout my entire life, as I know to, to everyone here in the room as well. I actually started this position back in December, and my second full week on the job as chief is when the president signed the Farm Bill into law. So what a tremendous honor and an opportunity it is for me and the staff to be able to spend so much of time. It's my first year in office to be able to really work on implementing this Farm Bill, and so it's been a great pleasure. I uh, want to recognize the folks that are on stage this afternoon as they'll be participating as well in the listening session. Uh, here's Jimmy Bramblett. Jimmy's our Deputy Chief for Programs here at NRCS. And, uh, the Farm Bill programs that we're going to be discussing fall within his shop and his dedicated team of folks. Um, Leslie Deavers, beside of him. Uh, Leslie is uh, our Farm Bill coordinator and also serves as our chief of staff for our associate chief, Kevin Norton, who's down here in front as well. Um, Keith Gray is chief of staff for the administrator at the Risk Management Association. And Steve Peterson is acting associate administrator for the Farm Service Agency. So when we talk conservation, Programs like uh, CRP actually fall within FSA, so we have all of our partners up here on stage to be able to listen and, and participate today. And I will mention that as we have begun working on the Farm Bill implementation, we have so many great dedicated employees on staff that have been working hard. And for, for many of our employees, this is their second, third Farm Bill, so they've had a lot of experience. But we really value your input today. And so thank you so much for coming to share today and then also for those that are participating and submitting online comments later as well. Uh, so uh, obviously with the programs that we operate at NRCS, the Farm Bill was crucial and certainly this uh, process that we're embarking on to write these rules and regulations is so very important. This Farm Bill, like the previous Farm Bill, demonstrates the strong congressional support for conservation. Um, it, 
it will help NRCS to continue to streamline, which is very important, to target and simplify our programs and will also help fulfill the Secretary's additional goal of improving overall customer service. Again, we'll talk more about that this afternoon, but that's uh, been a priority for our agency as well. Now, although there are many adjustments to programs that we'll talk about, uh, there are no new NRCS programs that were added within this Farm Bill and certainly none were eliminated. So what we're looking at is how we can improve these programs to make them better. So we want to kind of talk you through some of the high level details of each program and maybe pose some questions of things that we're actually working through as staff that will kind of help uh, give a guide in the, the discussions that will be taking place. So the conservation title increases funding for EQIP for ASEP and provides direct funding for RCPP, which is new this, this time around. Uh, additionally, robust support continues for CSP, despite a reduction of funding levels over a budgetary baseline, essentially replacing a, an average cap, an acreage cap in favor of yearly funding authorizations. So we'll talk a few, few minutes here about ASEP. Uh, several changes were made to the agricultural land easement component of ASEP that will improve our flexibility that we and our partners have to target and protect the conservation values on our productive agricultural lands. There is also an expansion into a new type of transaction called buy, protect, and sell, where partners acquire agricultural lands most at threat for conversion and then are able to sell them to a farmer or rancher with the protection of an agricultural leaseman in place. We want to assure that the availability of federal funding supports these types of transactions without adding to their inherent complexity, and they can be complex sometimes. Therefore, we are asking for your help to help us identify the types of scenarios that these transactions can be used best. The 2018 Farm Bill also modified the requirements for the non-federal share, which is a pretty new component uh, provided by eligibility entities under the ASEP agricultural land easements. The manager's report indicates that the program should not be limited to entities that can provide a cash match. Further, the manager's report indicates that Congress does not intend for NRCS to reject cash matches entirely, but broaden options available, available to eligible entities. How can NRCS ensure both equity for producers and flexibility for entities? One of the important questions we'll be working through. When we look at CSP, Congress transformed the nature of CSP, strengthening its ability to assist our farmers and ranchers to build upon their conservation efforts. In particular, CSP greatly incentivizes those practices that improve soil health, such as expanding conservation activities to include soil health planning, highlighting building soil organic matter through the adoption of resource conservation crop rotations, and advanced graze, grazing management systems. We are interested in hearing your ideas about how we can best tailor these incentives so that they sufficiently support producers' efforts in a financially responsible manner. With EQIP, Congress has improved the availability of the agency's premier working lands program by expanding EQIP to address new and challenging resource concerns through innovative approaches. In particular, EQIP assistance will be available for new and anticipated resource concerns. It also specifically recognizes that producers are facing resource concerns created by extreme weather events, and this enables NRCS to help assist producers adapt and mitigate against increased weather volatility. How can EQIP help producers with these new resource challenges? Also, how can EQIP assist with the adoption of beneficial cost-effective productive systems by addressing new and anticipated resource concerns? What type of production system transitions should EQIP assist by supporting? EQIP modifications improve water conservation and irrigation efficiency by allowing payments for scheduling, distrib distribution efficiency, and soil moisture monitoring. Irrigation-related structural or other measures that conserve surface or groundwater and making assistance available for producers who want to transition to water conserving crops and crop rotations. What issues or factors should we consider when developing procedures to implement these new provisions? The Farm Bill introduced new incentive contract enrollment options for EQIP that provides for practice installment and annual payments. How should EQIP and CSP, CSP be used in conjunction with each other to help prevent <coughs> overlap and improve opportunities for producers to address their resource concerns? The Conservation Innovation Grants, or CIG, component of EQIP is available by supporting the development of newer, innovative conservation approaches. 
The term new or innovative is defined as precision agriculture technologies, enhanced nutrient management plans, nutrient recovery systems, and fertilization systems, water management systems, soil health management, etc. What criteria should NRCS use to prioritize funding proposals defined as new or innovative approaches? With RCPP, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, this contains improvements to make it more efficient and effective. Impediments have been removed, enabling NRCS and our partners to better manage funding throughout the duration of the project. We are interested in your ideas of how NRCS can prioritize partner contributions, both financial and in-kind. The 2018 Farm Bill also encourages NRCS and our partners to move RCPP projects toward environmental, economic, and social, um, and social outcome-based reporting. What are some ideas to help us make that so? What are ways for NRCS to incentivize participation of historically underserved producers with our RCPP projects? I know that's a lot, but in summary, the Farm Bill will help us to, to reach more producers and give key information so they can make the best decisions for their land and, and most importantly for their bottom line. For our organic producers, both CSP and EQIP have provisions for organic farming. <coughs> How should the programs be used to maximize service to producers while avoiding overlap and competition between CSP and EQIP? The benefits of conservation are clear to us because We've seen it on our farms and our ranches, but we need to let other producers know about how conservation can help their operation. And this Farm Bill supports ways for us to be able to do that. Through on-farm demonstration trials and collaboration with our community colleges, our commercial enterprises, and other partnerships. It supports NRCS conservation programs and innovative technologies as well as ways for producers to assess their economic impacts before incorporating them into their own operations. In particular, the conservation title expands data availability and accessibility while protecting producer confidentiality. In particular, NRCS will be conducting a review of its conservation practices over the next year. We are interested in hearing from you about how our practice standards can be improved to address the conservation challenges that our producers face. Additionally, a focused NRCS team of natural resource specialists will work to provide more information about the outcomes of implementing these conservation measures. How can this information be provided most effectively to our conservation partners and producers? The Farm Bill is an extremely important tool, but it doesn't work without the dedication of the folks in the field, the NRCS office staff, our conservation partners, and most importantly, the farmers and ranchers that use it to make the best decisions for their land operations. Again, I want to thank all of you for, for participating with the NRCS in this partnership. I look forward to hearing your comments, and I look forward to hearing ways that we can make our programs more effective and efficient to benefit all those participants. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Matt. We appreciate that. And we're going to go to the audience now for comments. Again, if you'd like to provide some feedback for all of the topics we're covering today, you can come down here uh, to the first row, and we'll just kind of queue up here, and, and we are eagerly waiting your comments. I think I see a few people moving this way. And we'll begin over here. Good afternoon. Can you please tell us your name and your organization? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Lori Faith with the Land Trust Alliance. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to comment today on the implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill. The Land Trust Alliance is a nonprofit organization, a national land conservation organization based in Washington, D.C. We work to save places that people need and love by strengthening land conservation across the nation. We are the voice of private land conservation, unifying American ideals premised on personal initiative, landowner empowerment, and individual private property rights. On behalf of our 1,000-member land trust and nearly 5 million supporters that we represent, I appreciate, again, the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, our land trust, our members, have hands-on experience using the Farm Bill programs to help willing landowners protect the lands they love. We called on this experience in developing our 2018 Farm Bill recommendations, which in addition to increasing funding for programs like the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, focused on streamlining the programs by eliminating barriers to protecting the lands and clarifying congressional intent to ensure the programs are implemented consistently. 
We are extremely pleased with the 2018 Farm Bill, particularly as it relates to ASAP and the ale component of ASAP. In particular, they were happy, we are happy that Congress eliminated the onerous requirement for an ale plan. Rather than leading to increased conservation, ale plans often pretend, prevented important lands from being protected. Congressional intent in the 2018 Farm Bill is clear. The agency should not require a plan except for highly erodible lands. In our written comments, we will provide the agency with examples from Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, and North Carolina of lands that could have been protected using ale, but ultimately were not because of landowner concerns with overly prescriptive expectations um, from ale plans. With the elimination of this requirement, the NRCS can avoid these situations in the future so that important farms and ranches are protected and remain working lands. We note that eligible entities can still work with landowners to develop a conservation plan. Um, another provision that we are grateful for is um, the new matching fund provisions in allowing landowner donations and expenses to satisfy ale match requirements. Congress recognized the need to create the opportunities for landowners in areas that lack a state or local funding source to secure the cash match needed to access this program. Well, the uh, report language provided examples of states that lack a fund. It did not grant the Secretary the authority to limit this tool geographically. Um, state and local matching funds uh, vary greatly, and for example, an existing state, matching, uh, state conservation fund in Nebraska may soon be eliminated. So as the agency considers regulations and policies for this new provision, we urge it to recognize that it needs to be equitable, equitable for all. Congress also acknowledged the rigorous process to become an accredited land trust by opening a streamlined path for these land trusts to be recognized as a certified entity. In doing so, Congress established criteria for qualification, including the completion of at least 10 farm bill easements. At the end of 2018, there were 411 accredited land trusts, and it is not likely that all of them would wish to be recognized as certified entities. Therefore, we believe that this should be an opt-in policy with a simple verification process for qualified accredited land trusts. The statutory authority is, a direct, is in direct response to the lack of certified entities that came out of the 2014 Farm Bill. We hope that the department and land trusts alike will recognize the value of becoming certified. Our written comments will provide additional detail on these topics and other um, areas that are priorities for us, such as the buy, protect, sell provisions. Uh, in conclusion, I just want to say that we're committed to working with the agency on the implementation of the new Farm Bill. We understand the importance of the NRCS conservation programs to America's private lands and recognize that the programs must work well, not only for farmers and ranchers, but also for the NRCS and our partners. So I thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Some great comments on land trusts. We're going to go to the other side here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeremy Peters, the Chief Executive Officer for the National Association of Conservation Districts. Uh, I wanted to thank you uh, for holding the listening session uh, today to be able to provide comment on the Farm Production Conservation Mission Area Programs, uh, specifically the conservation title. Uh, Pleased to speak on behalf of uh, the National Association of Conservation Districts uh, today, the 3,000 conservation districts uh, from across the country that we represent, uh, the 17,000 men and women that serve on their local uh, governing boards. Uh, we'll be submitting more detailed uh, written comments uh, responding to the specific questions uh, that were provided in, in the notice, uh, but I wanted to be able to provide you uh, today with a few overarching themes that, that we'll be talking about in those written comments. Um, and uh, a, a few specifics. Uh, one area that I want to speak on is uh, just on the, uh, the concept of locally led conservation and uh, the importance of conservation districts in terms of being able to provide uh, local priorities, local decision making uh, as uh, USDA is getting uh, Farm Bill programs uh, implemented at, at the local level. Uh, the Farm Bill directs NRCS to use the state technical committees uh, to determine priority areas and to determine uh, priority watersheds, and that's something that we would reinforce. Uh, there's a lot of value uh, in terms of working through the state technical committees in terms of uh, how these programs will work at the, the state, the territory, and then ultimately at the, the local level. 
Uh, we encourage uh, NRCS as they're working through these various issues to also proactively engage and embrace the input not only from the state technical committees but also from the local work groups to take under advisement the specific comments uh, that uh, those leaders have uh, from their conservation district boards, from their communities uh, through, through that process as well. Another overarching uh, area that I want to speak about today uh, is also related to, uh, to workforce uh, needs in terms of Farm Bill program implementation. Uh, I want to offer praise for USDA's plans for moving quickly uh, to implement uh, the new provisions and also for providing opportunity for notice and comment on uh, the conservation programs, particularly uh, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, uh, which in its uh, first uh, implementation uh, was, was implemented without a rule. We're, we're very glad to see that RCPP will have uh, notice and comment in rulemaking um, uh, under the 2018 Farm Bill uh, implementation. We would encourage USDA to continue moving forward uh, with the dual responsibilities of getting program dollars out in a timely fashion uh, while also uh, working through uh, the rulemaking process. Uh, we applaud NRCS's NRC goal to finalize interim rules uh, later this fall. Uh, we appreciate that timeline. Uh, and we encourage NRCS to continue engaging with stakeholders before, during, and after the comment period to make an effort to hear about how the programs are working, uh, not only uh, as you're going through the uh, initial phases of implementation, but also following up uh, to, to continue to make sure that uh, programs are working properly to put conservation on the ground. Uh, we also need to continue to encourage uh, uh, progress on identifying and filling the workforce needs that exist, uh, as well as continued progress uh, to ensure that there are strong administ administrative support uh, functions through the Farm Production and Conservation Business Center. We know that's critical uh, to make sure that uh, that delivery is going smoothly. Uh, so we're encouraged by USDA's effort to improve customer service and address areas where uh, there have been chronic understaffing uh, issues. Uh, glad to, to see that, uh, that there have, have been advances and progress made in that area. We would encourage uh, the department to continue uh, making progress uh, to, to add capacity uh, in, in places where that is, is desperately needed. Uh, as USDA gets Farm Bill implementation underway, uh, we, we definitely need to make sure that we have all hands on deck uh, to, to make sure that we're managing the dual responsibilities of continuing to engage with customers, uh, to get folks signed up for programs while also writing conservation plans, uh, all of which are, are necessary uh, in, to, to be able to successfully implement the new bill. Uh, so again, we'll be providing uh, more detailed comments on some of the specific questions uh, program related, uh, but it, again, wanted to thank you for the opportunity today uh, to speak to you on behalf of the National Association of Conservation Districts. Thank you. And some great comments on local-led conservation. Um, just a reminder, we'd like you to keep your comments to under four minutes if you can. We've got quite a, quite a lineup of folks here, so we just want to make sure everyone gets equal time. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chief Luer and colleagues. My name is John Piotti. I'm the president and CEO of American Farmland Trust. Since the early 1980s, AFT has been the leading national advocate for farmland and ranch land protection, as well as partners in many other conservation programs. AFT will be submitting detailed written comments later. Today, I will limit my comments to responses to two questions that were posed in the Federal Register. On ASAP, you ask about how the new authority to support buy, protect, sell transactions might work. Buy, protect, sell, or BPS, is a term that I coined at Maine Farmland Trust when we began buying properties ourselves, protecting them with easements, and then reselling them to farmers. We created our BPS program for the same reason that other land trusts around the country created theirs, because it is an extremely useful tool in the toolbox. Clearly, the farmland that is most in jeopardy is that which is about to be sold for non-agricultural use. BSP projects target this most vulnerable land and then enable farmers to acquire it affordably. This has helped both existing farmers who wish to expand and new farmers who are getting started. The Farm Bill sets up two arrangements for BPS projects. In these comments, I'm going to focus on the second type, where the land is sold after the easement is closed. We see two scenarios that would be legally effective here. One scenario involves a collaboration between two eligible entities. The first entity would apply for ASEP funds and a second entity would hold or co-hold the easement. 
the first entity would then have three years to sell the property to a farmer or rancher. A second scenario involves a single entity that both buys and then protects the property holding the easement. This entity would apply for ASEP funds, record an easement, be reimbursed for the federal share of the easement value, and then have three years to sell the property to a farmer or rancher. AFT does not believe that the doctrine of merger would apply here. First, because the federal government retains a contingent interest in the easement, and second, because the entity's interest in the conservation easement differs substantially from its interest in the fee-held land. Yet to remove any potential concerns about merger, AFT recommends that USDA first require that the language in the easement clarify that easement does not apply, and second, that it require the eligible entity to re-record the easement upon sale of the land to the farmer or rancher. On RCPP, you ask about how NRCS can encourage outcomes-based reporting. AFT is a strong proponent of using environmental, economic, and social outcomes data to gauge the benefits of voluntary conservation practices. We've done so in our own current RCPP project in the Upper Macoupin Creek watershed. We're using in-stream monitoring and computer modeling to track nutrient reductions. We're also using surveys to gauge changes in various social indicators, such as farmer awareness of water quality issues. And before the project is complete, we will interview farmers who adopt new soil health practices to quantify any changes in profitability. But we've crafted these techniques on our own, and we know that this kind of effort may be hard for groups that don't have AFT's background in outcomes-based reporting. To help future project participants better measure and report on outcomes, we have three recommendations. First, that NRCS support an online information clearinghouse to share resources, and that may work well in partnership with the Farmland Information Center, which we currently run together with NRCS. Second, that NRCS hold webinars for project partners to learn from one another. And third, that NRCS develop an outcomes quantification methodology manual and provide trainings using that manual. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, John. We appreciate that. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Julie Grogan Brown with National Audubon Society. Um, I run the Working Lands Program, um, where we uh, help protect the places that are important to birds, people, and communities. And as a result of that, partnerships with farmers, ranchers, and private foresters are, of course, a critical piece. Um, so there are many things that we love about the Farm Bill, but I'm not going to spend time talking about them because you asked us not to, so I just want to be clear about that. Um, so starting with RCPP, and one of the hallmarks of RCPP is the flexibility it provides to build partnerships to use the most effective strategies to address critical resource issues at a landscape scale in a meaningful way. Critical conservation areas, or CCAs, reflect that strength and importance. However, NRCS must also enable these landscape scale collaborative partnerships in other areas across the country. The bill explicitly allows for multi-state projects to be funded through the state funding pool and the, state, the sagebrush steppe ecosystem, northeastern forests, Delaware River watershed, and many other landscapes must have a place in this program's administration. For multi-state projects outside of CCAs, we strongly encourage NRCS to allow project leads to work with one lead state to administer the project, as was previously allowed in the national funding pool, and to set up a process that allows for larger scale funding for these multi-state projects than typical projects currently funded out of the state funding pool. Um, Section 2703 also provides for renewals and extensions of existing RCPP contracts. Several highly successful projects from the first round of selections in 2015, such as Audubon's partnerships with dairy farmers and rice farmers in the Central Valley of California, are in their final year of implementation. And these and other projects provide important assistance in reducing the conflict between wildlife and agriculture and help reduce regulatory burdens on farmers and ranchers. We encourage NRCS to implement a quick, flexible, and administratively easy 
renewal process immediately for projects that have demonstrated high success in order to either expand the project area or the lifespan. On EQIP, <clears throat> the changes allow the Secretary to enter into contracts with irrigation districts and similar entities uh, to effectively conserve water, provide fish and wildlife habitat, or provide for drought-related environmental, environmental mitigation where such practices are part of a larger watershed-wide project. Implementing this provision will be key to making EQIP more accessible to growers in the Colorado River Basin, where irrigation districts and similar entities own and maintain much of the water delivery infrastructure. We urge NRCS to work closely with Western growers and their water suppliers to ensure that this new contracting authority indeed translates to more water conservation, improved fish and wildlife habitat, and makes agricultural communities in the Colorado River Basin and across the West better equipped to face drought in healthier watersheds. It was referenced in the manager's report that contracts with practices for the sole benefit of wildlife should not be limited to any other term less than the 10 years allowed under statute. We encourage NRCS to begin entering into 10-year contracts for wildlife habitat practices immediately, and we look forward to working with the agency to implement these longer contracts with producers. Finally, in the Watershed Act, Section 2401, it allows the Secretary to waive the watershed plan requirement if it would be necessary or duplicative. We urge NRCS to interpret this new authority broadly in the context of drought resilience, water quality, watershed restoration, and other land treatment projects. Eliminating the need to produce redundant planning and staff work, excuse me, and paperwork, will save time for both recipients and NRCS staff, allowing work to begin on the ground more expeditiously. We look forward to working with you in these and other areas, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Julie. It's good to hear from the Audubon Society. Sir, good uh, afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Harley Cross. I'm the co-founder of an organization called LandCorp. As an organization, we're working to build the missing infrastructure and market-based economic incentives that will make the rapid adoption and scalability of soil health possible across the country. Um, first. When we look at conservation goals in the Farm Bill, broadly speaking, we as an organization are advocating that the, that the USDA uh, encourage outcomes verification of soil health across the board. Uh, conservation is almost entirely practice-based today, uh, meaning we ask the question, did we do it? But we very rarely ask the question, did it work? Um, the NRCS uh, Soil Health Division um, has made some great strides in the last few years with ARS and NEFA. Um, to agree on common principles, indicators, and most importantly, testing methodologies for soil health that can be used today to establish, at the very least, some simple baselines. And using these tools, as an absolute minimum, we should be testing for soil organic matter, water infiltration rates, soil aggregation, and water quality across the board in all programs where it's applicable. We've listened to literally hundreds of soil health experts, scientists, farmers, and ranchers across the country, and they all agree that these are essential indicators that'll give us some real sense of whether or not things are getting better or if they're getting worse. Um, and these tests are things we can do in a consistent, empirical, and accessible way today. Uh, this is something we don't have to talk about for another decade. Uh, we can do it now. And we think that this will uh, improve the outcomes of conservation broadly in the Farm Bill. Um, speaking specifically about SIG, we are big fans of SIG in our organization. Um, and as it relates to the on-farm conservation trials, I'm going to stick with this outcomes theme. Uh, LandCorp strongly recommends that as a condition for all the grants, um, that outcomes verification of soil health be an indicator. Um, the same the four that I previously mentioned, SOM, water infiltration, uh, soil aggregates, and water quality, that they be collected um, using those same standards that are agreed by ARS, uh, NRCS, and NEFA before, during, and after the trials. Um, otherwise, how can we quantify the impacts uh, and the benefits of new and innovative approaches if we don't have a baseline from wi with which to uh, gauge success? And we're not suggesting that these are necessarily the way to evaluate um, the successes or failures of any given project, but to contextualize those projects. What's happening around the individual outcome or indicator that the grant was designed to address? Are there unintended consequences? Uh, and this kind of testing would create a consistent baseline from which to evaluate the broader context of these projects. Finally, 
Um, a few words on probably our favorite program uh, currently, uh, the Soil Health Demonstration Trial. Um, we are excited by the project's potential to accelerate the adoption of soil health. Um, as you might imagine, we uh, appreciate its uh, focus on outcomes, um, and we are looking uh, forward to the new and innovative testing methodologies that will be developed and, and uh, all the things that will encourage innovation in the soil health space more broadly. Um, this program also offers the potential for our producers to access new carbon markets, which aligns with one of our core objectives, which is to see more ways for farmers and ranchers to profit from soil restoration, uh, not through government subsidies, but through market-based incentives. Um, and as such, we recommend that the agency allocate no less than $10 million of the $25 million authorized uh, from the SIG on Farm Innovation Trials to go towards the soil health demonstration trials. Other specific recommendations um, for awarding these grants, obviously uh, we would love to see uh, outcomes verification as we described above, um, as a, being a condition for access to these grants. Um, we'd like to uh, prioritize uh, funding for proposals that implement and test the benefit of multiple conservation uh, practices at once, uh, not just the examination of a single practice applied in isolation. Um, ensure that 50% that of the funds go to trials um, for participants who have small to medium-sized farms um, and farming operations. And we'd like to see a diversity of operations receive these grants uh, from, uh, you know, uh, specialty crops to rangelands, uh, commodity crops, and so on. Um, I appreciate your time, and uh, thank you. We appreciate the comment on soil health. Thank you. Also, if you have comments related to farm loans, credit loans, crop insurance, anything that we covered this morning, you're also welcome to come up and, and give some comments on that. We'll go over here. Good afternoon. Hi. Laura Bryant from Natural Resources Defense Council, and I'm glad for this opportunity to give some additional comments today um, on, um, on practices that are related to NRCS. I gave some this morning to RMA. So echoing uh, Lane Course. Uh, comments, we are really excited about this new soil health demonstration trial and we're looking forward to the implementation of that program. Um, we have some things that we really, really want to see and, and want to echo the, the focus on outcomes-based uh, verification. It's important um, that the program start from a baseline of, of standardized soil carbon measurements, um, again with soil health experts and um, such as the researchers that you work with all the time and those who have built and maintain a comet farm. Um, we recommend a, a strategy that pays producers up front for uh, baseline soil testing and the practices, but then follows up and looks at the outcomes and develops a method for payment based on the outcomes of those practices. Um, we also want to recommend, uh, recommend that you assess and analyze um, future program potential based on this program um, and look at soil organic carbon conservation activity plan and a, a methodology for structuring future cost share uh, payments according to soil carbon improvements. Uh, next, some comments on providing service to organic produce producers. Um, we recommend that NRCS, along with the other agencies, uh, consider streamlining mecha mechanisms such as single application and automatic enrollment for uh, all relevant programs, including CSP and uh, EQIP, and uh, also the risk management and crop insurance programs. Organic farmers and ranchers are likely to be eligible for multiple programs, and they also bear heavy, heavier costs and administrative burdens due to their certification obligations. So anything that can ease their burdens um, is really critical to their participation. Um, in regards to your, your question about water conservation and efficiency um, and within EQIP, uh, we recommend in RCS consider the following. Uh, the benefits of your upgrades to uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, whether your upgrades inhibit or encourage groundwater recharge in areas where the aquifers are depleted and where the soils allow for recharge. Um, prioritize water infrastructure that is upgrading agricultural water delivery systems so that they're pressurized. And uh, to also echo, echo uh, previous comments, whether the improved efficiencies in water uh, infrastructure are going to lead to improved environmental outcomes. Do these water savings result in expanded acreage, which would lead to uh, destruction of habitat and soil loss, for example, is a question that you might consider. So thank you. All right, thank you. We'll take those comments back to RMA and NRCS. 
Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide these comments. My name is Adam Carpenter with the American Water Works Association. Our membership spans over 52,000 individuals, including over 4,200 drinking water utilities. I'm here to discuss the provisions for source water protection found in the Farm Bill. Our primary interest lies in Section 2503, which includes four provisions that will greatly help to protect sources of drinking water, including, first, encouraging practices that protect source water, second, working with water utilities to identify areas where source water protection is needed, third, increasing financial assistance for practices that have a large off-farm uh, source water protection benefits but little to no on-farm benefits, and four, uh, in requiring that at least 10% of conservation program funding, except for the CRP, go towards source water protection. It is vital that USDA carefully and thoroughly implement these provisions to protect public health and to be of the greatest benefit to local communities, including both water utilities that serve the community and agricultural producers. AWWA and water utilities look forward to cooperating, uh, to cooperatively partnering with agricultural producers, NRCS, conservation districts, and other partners to protect sources of drinking water, to minimize these risks while en enhancing benefits to producers and the environment alike. For many years, the Farm Bill Conservation Programs have made considerable progress in tackling issues around Clean Water Act impaired water bodies. Although some of this work may also help to protect sources of potable water, meaningful progress to help limit cyanobacterial blooms, reduce nutrients, lessen sediment and chemical loads, and ensure adequate supplies requires planning specifically to source water concerns of those potable water supply sources. Section 2503 makes source water protection, the protection of sources of potable water, a specific priority of the conservation programs. By authorizing the Secretary to work with drinking water utilities and the state technical committees to identify priority source water protection areas in each state opens a huge opportunity for USDA to work with a non-traditional constituency. Additionally, by authorizing increased financial assistance for practices that have significant downstream water quality or quantity benefits but little to no on-farm benefit will make it easier for producers to implement these vital practices. Finally, targeting 10% of conservation title spending for protecting sources of potable water will provide the resources to make a real and lasting impact to the nation's drinking water. USDA and NRCS have many details to work out to ensure that this spending is effective in meeting the intended goals. We look forward to working with collaboratively with you in assuring that the definitions and criteria for source water and source water protection are clear, consistent with utility practice, and meet the intent of the law identifying additional utility, state, and other contacts for state conservationists to develop their networks within the water sector beyond those that we've previously provided, identifying which practices will be eligible for increased cost share under these provisions, working with to ensure NRCS ranking criteria reflect the high priority for source water protection practices, finding ways to encourage utilities to participate in the state technical committees and local working groups, to partner with conservation districts and other established groups on projects, and finally clarifying how the 10% target will be reached, tracked, and reported. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to providing additional detailed written comments. All right, thank you. Great comments on Section 25 of the Farm Bill. Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Kamrath. I'm the Washington representative for the Union of Concerned Scientists Food and Environment Program. Uh, UCS is a nonprofit organization committed to science-based policy, and I'm happy to be here on behalf of our 500,000 members nationwide. Uh, the following comments will be in regards to the Conservation Stewardship Program. Um, UCS has found CSP to be one of the most important conservation programs in the United States, as, as it is the only working lands program in the 2018 Farm Bill that directly supports comprehensive whole farm conservation. Um, UCS analysis of CSP has found that for every dollar Invested in CSP, farmers and taxpayers can expect to see $4 in return. Although the 2018 Farm Bill decreases overall baseline funding for CSP, it does authorize NRCS to set increased payments for select conservation activities like cover crops, resource conserving, crop rotations, and grazing management. UCS would like to recommend that NRCS provide adequate payment rates to incentivize these important activities for soil health. Secondly, the 2018 Farm Bill changes the process for renewing CSP contracts in a way that no longer guarantees funding for renewals. 
UCS recommends that for farmers seeking to renew their contracts, NRCS consider farmers' existing contract and reward them within the total ranking pool for having already participated in the program. Rewarding past participants for their participation would have the dual benefit of reinforcing the importance and the benefit of long-term conservation practices while also <coughs> encouraging farmers to reach for higher <coughs> levels of conservation. Third, in regard to NRCS's ability to support precision agriculture, UCS recommends that NRCS consider a broad definition of precision agriculture to allow for the most innovation. For example, UCS recommends that NRCS consider how to advance precision <coughs> agri agriculture for diversified farms and to incorporate the concept of precision, precision conservation into planning with the goal of optimizing areas that deliver ecosystem services beyond yield. In regard to NRCS's question about how to prevent overlap of, e of EQIP and CSP programs, UCS recommends that NRCS coordinate sign-up periods, timelines, and promotions of opportunities for CSP and EQIP. UCS believes that CSP and EQIP serve unique functions and must be promoted equally to farmers. Furthermore, UCS recommends that NRCS find ways to encourage farmers to use EQIP as a stepping stone for CSP funding as their level of stewardship practices advance. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, UCS. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello, Kelly Ingebrigtsen, the Conservation Fund. Chief Lore and colleagues, thank you for this opportunity today. The Conservation Fund is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to making conservation work for America by creating environmental and economic solutions. To date, and established in 1985 to date, we've helped conserve over 8 million acres with our partners, including 1.2 million acres of agricultural lands in 18 states and over 60 projects with the NRCS. We offer the following recommendations for NRCS programs in Farm Bill Title II. For Subtitle F, Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, we have two recommendations for the definition section. Number one, for the buy, protect, sell definition. We recommend that NRCS clearly outline the scenario where one eligible entity owns the land and another eligible entity acquires the conservation easement. The method should ensure that a conservation NGO can be an eligible landowner, permit another eligible entity to acquire the easement, and then allow three years after the easement acquisition for the land sale. Secondly, for the eligible land definition and the, for the agricultural land easements. We recommend in the forthcoming updated ASEP rule to clarify that agricultural land easements can be on up to 100% forest land to be consistent with the consolidated and broadened purpose of NRCS's one combined easement program for working agricultural lands held by eligible entities. In other words, the elimination of the two-thirds forest land limit in the former rule imposed through prior rulemaking a limit that is not in the statute. All eligible landowners should have an equitable opportunity to implement critical conservation projects, including forest landowners. Clarifying the forest land eligibility and the new rule will further NRCS conservation goals in America. Third, for the agricultural land easements generally, we recommend NRCS clarify the co-eligible entity process and the AL rule manual application cooperative agreement and other forms to improve entity participation. To distinguish the co-eligible entity process is a different concept in the co-holder process. For co-eligible entities, the process uses partnerships such as a national NGO playing one, some roles pre-closing of, of an AL easement and a local land trust performing post-closing roles. This process will build capacity and accelerate agricultural conservation. Finally, for Subtitle G, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, we recommend that RCPP continues to fund working forest conservation easements and other agricultural conservation easements with continuing the option for eligible entities to own the easements and a federal government ownership option as well as continuing easements on conservation NGO-owned land. We, the RCBP should continue the scope of the Healthy Forest Reserve Program and the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program and broaden it. Giving landowners, land trusts, partners, and others more tools, options, and flexibility to implement conservation easements 
will accelerate the pace of conservation in the United States. We look forward to working with you and thank you for this opportunity. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate that. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, I'm Kelly Smalls, Director of Public Policy with Ducks Unlimited. We are a um, nonprofit wetlands waterfowl conservation organization with about 750,000 members across the country. Thanks for the opportunity to come here and talk to you today. Um, DU recognizes that we could not accomplish our conservation mission without the help of private landowners, and those private landowners rely on you guys very heavily. So thank you for your continued partnership, and uh, thanks for letting us speak today. I'll be quick, I hope. Um, we're really excited about the Farm Bill uh, Conservation Reserve Program. We're excited to see the um, Congress raise the cap on that to 27 million acres. We'd love to see USDA keep that um, acre limit as close to the cap as possible. Um, the Ag Conservation Easement Program, another huge priority for DU. Um, 450 million year, dollars a year is um, a great improvement. We'd love to see NRCS um, really focus on management of existing um, <coughs> projects so that we can keep that environmental benefit on um, current lands. RCPP has obviously been a huge success in leveraging private dollars. Uh, as you all move forward in implementing changes made in the final bill, we urge NRCS to um, make sure successful projects can continue. EQIP, obviously we're excited for the increased funding in EQIP as well. 10% to wildlife is a great opportunity. Um, we would encourage NRCS to utilize longer term contracts for wildlife practices, um, especially those that include carrying out post-harvest flooding and maintaining that hydrology of temporary and seasonal wetlands. Um, finally, I'd like to touch on conservation compliance. Um, we were happy to see that that linkage between <laughs> conservation and federal programs continued. Um, central to that compact is the use of accurate wetland determinations. Um, thanks again for your partnership. We look forward to working with you on the 18 Farm Bill. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Lots of good feedback on RCPP. Ma'am. Hi, I'm Sylvia Malm. I'm uh, the advisor for source water protection with the Groundwater Protection Council, and I grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania, so I'm delighted to have that history and to be able to participate today. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm representing the Groundwater Protection Council and the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators. Those organizations represent, um, the professional organization representing the state um, drinking water and groundwater programs that are responsible for implementation of the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act as well as voluntary state source water programs covering both groundwater and surface water. Our two organizations are also co-chairs of the Source Water Collaborative, which is a 27-member national organization. Members, and they focus on protecting sources of drinking water through their own individual priorities and goals. NRCS, I'm happy to say, is a member. Also FSA, <coughs> excuse me, AWWA, who was represented here today by Adam Carpenter. Um, NACD, also represented here today, and um, several other members, National World Water Association. However, today my comments are focused um, on the source water protection provision in the Farm Bill that Adam already described for you and I'm sure you're familiar with. We are representing just those two organizations, not the other organizations in the collaborative or the full collaborative in our comments today. Um, I know that, that Jimmy has already seen this, but I will just, for visual, if you can see the shaking hands here, um, we are really focused on promoting partnerships with NRCS and the state source water coordinators at the state level and community water systems, strengthening those um, where they're not as strong as, as they could be. But there is significant common ground between state source water coordinators and NRCS, particularly on the voluntary approach to landowners. Um, including non-industrial, private, forested landowners and mutual goals of protecting and improving soil health and water quality. Already we have many examples in many states of effective working relationships between state conservationists and source water coordinators. There's important work underway through RCPP, 
the NWQI source water pilot that just started up, the Joint Chiefs Landscape Partnership Initiative, and also through other conservation program programs like EQUIP and ASAP. In addition to working with agricultural producers, NRCS and state source water programs are working with private forested landowners to protect priority drinking water supplies. Source water coordinators can provide important expertise and resources to aid in implementation of the Farm Bill source water protection provisions. They have maps of source water protection areas, information on priority contaminant concerns, and the ability to engage other partners, including community water supplies. So I have three, uh, four recommendations. We've already submitted our written comments, but I just wanted to highlight here. Uh, we would like to see increased source water protection through the implementation of conservation practices in every state and hope that every NRCS office will reach out to the state source water coordinator as an essential contributor to implementing the Farm Bill source water protection provisions. Number two, we encourage NRCS to use the full range of allowable conservation programs to account for the 10% of conservation dollars directed to source water protection. We hope that NRCS will continue RCPP and the NWQI source water pilot, which, will, which have been catalysts for partnerships to protect priority drinking water supplies. Already we know of success stories there. We can't always see them in the descriptions, but we know that drinking water sources are being protected, especially um, with RCPP. To, number three, to aid in directing conservation funding to source water protection in each state, we recommend that NRCS systematically include source water protection criteria for awards under initiatives like RCPP. In addition, source water protection should be included in state and local ranking points for EQUIP. Number four, we recommend that projects addressing source water protection be clearly identified and tracked so that successful approaches and partnerships can be shared and replicated. We look forward to the opportunity to work with NRCS as you're developing your approach to the implementing the source water provision, and uh, we'd be happy to respond to any questions as you go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. For suggestions to table there. Good, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Alyssa Charney, Senior Policy Specialist at the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Earlier today, my colleagues provided comments on credit and crop insurance, and we welcome the opportunity to provide comment on the 2018 Farm Bill. I will provide recommendations on a few of our conservation priorities, and will also be submitting more detailed implementation recommendations later this week. Let me start with the question posed by NRCS regarding the coordination between EQIP and CSP, the two major working lands conservation programs. We are pleased that the Farm Bill retains both conservation programs, recognizing the unique benefits that each provides. The Farm Bill directs NRCS to provide coordination and streamlining procedures for EQIP and CSP. We support this coordination while also pointing out the following significant differences between the two programs. CSP offers comprehensive conservation assistance across an entire operation, whereas EQIP provides cost share for individual conservation practices. CSP payments reflect the existing levels of stewardship at the time of application, plus payments for additional conservation activities, whereas EQIP payments only support new conservation activities. Additionally, CSP eligibility is based on meeting the stewardship threshold for two resource concerns at the time of application, whereas EQIP does not have a stewardship eligibility requirement. We urge NRCS to retain and promote these key differences while equally promoting and supporting both programs. Even with the addition of incentive contracts within EQIP, the differences between these two programs still apply, and thus EQIP incentive contracts are not duplicative of the comprehensive conservation support that is provided through CSP. We do, however, welcome this addition of incentive contracts as an opportunity to provide longer-term management-focused conservation support within EQIP. We urge NRCS to promote incentive contracts as a tool participants can utilize to qualify for th CSP through a seamless graduation process. If incentive contracts holders meet the stewardship threshold for two priority resource concerns across the entire operation before the end of an incentive contract and wish to move to comprehensive conservation in CSP, we urge NRCS to allow them to make this transition and end their incentive contract early without any penalty for doing so. In terms of implementation of CSP, our most immediate recommendation is regarding FY19 sign-up. 
We urge NRCS to move forward with the FY19 process as quickly as possible so that farmers have time to work with NRCS through the evaluation tools and application process. We understand there are delays on the funding availability side of things, but at the same time, farmers are able to currently go into their NRCS offices and begin this sign-up process. There is confusion around the fact that this is an option right now, so we urge NRCS to make a national announcement promoting this opportunity that the sign-up process can begin. This announcement can also be made in conjunction with information regarding contract extensions. Waiting until this spring to formally announce this FY19 CFSP sign-up is too late. Farmers will be well into the growing season and it is essential to put out a national announcement that clarifies producers can now begin the process of applying for CSP. Additionally, we urge you to move, as you move forward with the FY19 sign-up, um, incorporate the changes that were made for increased payments for cover crops and resource conserving crop rotations prior to the release of an interim rule. Um, responding to the question of EQIP Irrigation Authority, we urge NRCS to strictly enforce the new statutory requirement that the state funding allocations cannot be adjusted as a result of this new provision. And with regard to the changes made to the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, we urge NRCS to ensure that there is a fully developed rule in place before moving forward with the sign-up process um, after the restructured program no longer utilizes the covered programs. Um, finally, we urge FSA to quickly move forward with the CRP sign-up this fiscal year, including opening the continuous enrollment option, including CLEAR and CREP. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment on these provisions. We will be supporting, submitting more detailed recommendations in our written statement. All right. Thank you for commenting. Appreciate everyone coming out today. We'll uh, move to the left here, sir. Thank you for taking the time to consider public input on the implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill's programs. I'm Tristan Daedalus, and I'm speaking on behalf of the American Forest Foundation, a conservation organization working with the over 20 million family forest owners who own the largest share of forested acres in the United States. Among the many programs that assist landowners in the bill, I want to highlight some that would be particularly helpful to forest landowners as they seek to provide our nation with clean water, a sustainable wood supply, and secure wildlife habitat. Landowners repeatedly tell us of their desire to assist endangered or threatened species by restoring critical forest habitat. The healthy, <coughs> excuse me, the healthy Forest Reserve Program can help landowners conserve this habitat while providing regulatory assurance that the work they do will not lead to additional regulatory burdens. The Farm Bill encourages NRCS to remove duplicative approval requirements that discourage landowners from enrolling, and we believe this will increase overall program effectiveness. As NRCS implements the changes Congress made to the Conservation Stewardship Program, we also encourage the staff to support CSP's integral role as the largest working lands conservation program in the United States by acreage. Understanding that the program is already highly competitive, we would like to reiterate its value to family forest owners in allowing them to improve management in a way that meets natural resource goals. Similarly, we support the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and urge similar attention be paid to continuing to strengthen the program's support for family forest owners and needed forest management. Finally, we would ask NRCS to thoroughly test the Regional Conservation Partnership Program's newly authorized alternative funding distribution mechanisms to encourage partner organizations to take an active role in conserving resources on the landscape, allowing federal investment to complement private sector funding through these novel payment mechanisms can open the door to new methods of conservation that we are excited to see. Thank you again for opening the floor, and uh, we look forward to working with you. All right. Thank you, Tristan. Appreciate that. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aviva Glazer. I'm the Director of Agriculture Policy at the National Wildlife Federation. NWF is America's largest conservation organization, representing over six million members, supporters, and affiliates across the country. We want to thank USDA for this opportunity today to weigh in on implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill, and we're looking forward to working with you in the coming months to ensure that the programs are implemented in a way that maximizes conservation benefits. Uh, I'm going to give just a few high-level recommendations today, and then we'll be submitting more detailed recommendations. Um, first, I wanted to touch on the Conservation Reserve Program. We urge USDA to move forward quickly with ensuring that enrollment in CRP is as close to the acreage cap as possible. Uh, current enrollment numbers at approximately 22.5 million acres 
are 1.5 million acres under the FY19 cap with an additional 1.6 million acres set to expire at the end of this fiscal year. We risk being as much as 3 million acres under the cap without an FY19 sign up, which of course would be a lost opportunity for conservation as well as for producers. So we urge you to hold a general sign up this fiscal year um, as required by law, as well as opening up continuous sign up, including high value wildlife, wetland, pollinator and water quality practices. For the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, we're very excited that this farm bill increases the percentage of EQIP funds going towards wildlife practices from at least 5% to at least 10% of total program funds. And we urge the implementation of this increased allocation as quickly as possible. Um, and we also are, encourage NRCS to require that every state have a state wildlife funding pool within EQIP to better e focus EQIP wildlife funding on species and habitats that are identified in existing state, regional, and national wildlife plans, such as the State Wildlife Action Plans and the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. We also encourage NRCS to use this funding to expand the successful Working Lands for Wildlife model to include new programs and new projects and to provide dedicated funding from EQIP as well as from other programs. Next, I wanted to touch on wetland conservation compliance. Uh, we're pleased that the 2018 Farm Bill did not contain any significant changes to wetland conservation compliance, despite numerous proposals to do so. Given the clear congressional intent to maintain this longstanding compact between American taxpayers and farmers, we strongly urge USDA to refrain from making any changes to swamp buster implementation that could result in the loss of wetlands and undermine the spirit and purpose of this contract including the changes that were proposed in the interim final rule on wetland and highly erodible land conservation that was published this past December and which would result in a loss of protection for seasonal wetlands. Finally, I wanted to touch on cover crops uh, and crop insurance, um, even though I know it's not directly in the conservation title, um, but we are really excited that the Farm Bill included important new language that clarifies that cover crops should be considered a good farming practice. Uh, and directs the secretary to establish termination guidelines for cover crops. These changes should provide needed clarity for both to farmers and to crop insurers, and we urge USDA to work with crop insurance companies and other stakeholders to educate farmers and agents on the new definition of termination and on the inclusion of cover crops as good farming practices. This would help avoid any confusion that folks might have. We also encourage USDA to reconvene the interagency task force on cover crop policy to update the cover crop guidelines. Um, in conclusion, just want to thank you for the opportunity to present these recommendations. We look forward to submitting more detailed recommendations and working with agency staff in the coming months on these and on additional recommendations. Uh, and thank you for your time. All right. Thank you and thank NWF. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Annie Shapiro, and I'm with the AGREE Initiative for Transforming Food and Ag Policy. And I'm speaking today on behalf of the AGREE Conservation and Crop Insurance Task Force. We are a diverse coalition of producers, former USDA leaders, academics, researchers, and conservation groups that are all working together to drive broader adoption of conservation practices. So I'll keep my comments very brief. Um, they're going to be primarily about the conservation data provision that is actually located in the miscellaneous title, but that dovetails very well with a lot of the provisions in the conservation title and in Title I commodities with regard to the acreage crop reporting streamlining initiative, also known as accuracy. USDA could better optimize public resources by more fully harnessing ag data to improve the understanding of the correlation between yield variability and conservation, which can improve producer profitability, strengthen the crop insurance program, and also improve environmental performance on farms. The Farm Bill Law directs the Secretary to produce a report that would identify all the available USDA data sets on conservation practices and summarize the effects of those practices on crop yields, farm and ranch profitability, and soil health. It also directs USDA to summarize the data and the steps needed to provide secure data access to verified university researchers. The Acreage Crop Reporting Streamlining Initiative, Accuracy, also directs FSA, RMA, and NRCS to continue to improve coordination and information sharing between the agencies. We believe that it's very critical to harness ag data to its full extent 
to improve farmer success and conserve natural resources, while importantly protecting producer data privacy. The law will help farmers make data-driven land management decisions about which practices are most profitable and also most productive. The ag community, including commodity groups, supply chain companies, farmers, land-grant university researchers, and many others are united in support of this legislation. So in closing, AGREE's Conservation and Crop Insurance Task Force looks forward to working closely with USDA to write the study and to pilot these important provisions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Annie. Accuracy is a big topic here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Magus and I'm the Director of Agriculture at the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. This partnership includes 58 leading hunting, fishing, and conservation organizations that represent millions of sportsmen and women across the country. The comments I'm going to provide here today do not represent the full suite of priorities from our partners, but they do represent areas of consensus from these partners, many of which you've heard from today or will hear from soon. On CRP, as of October of last year, the program was nearly 1.5 million acres short of the statutory cap. Additionally, we expect another 1.6 million acres to expire at the end of this fiscal year. In order to bring enrollment closer to the statutory cap, the working group encourages the agency to hold a general sign-up this fiscal year as required by law, as well as a continuous sign-up that includes high-value wetland and wildlife practices. Regarding equip. Our working group suggests supports the increased designation of wildlife practices from 5 to at least 10 percent, and we urge the implementation of this increased allocation as soon as possible. We encourage NRCS to ensure that every state has a state wildlife funding pool within EQUIP to better focus EQUIP wildlife funding on priority species and habitats identified in existing state, regional, or national wildlife plans, such as state wildlife action plans, the North American Waterfall Management Plan, and other wildlife habitat conservation initiatives. We also encourage NRCS to use this funding to expand the successful Working Lands for Wildlife model to include new projects and to receive dedicated funding from EQUIP. On ASEP, we support Buy, Protect, Sell as a strategic way to protect agricultural lands. We request the agency's implementation of the Buy, Protect, Sell method. Ensure eligible entity owned land is eligible land, including conservation NGO land. Permit another eligible entity to acquire the agricultural land easement and allow three years after the easement acquisition date for the land sale to a far farmer or rancher. The working group also recommends that the secretary clarify that ale can be on up to 100% forest land, consistent with the consolidated and broadened purpose of NRCS combined easement program for working lands held by eligible entities. On RCPP, as NRCS moves to implement the significant changes that Farm Bill made to RCPP, we encourage NRCS to create a separate RCPP agreement, distinct from EQUIP, CRP, CSP, and ASEP agreements. Further, we urge the agency to move quickly in developing rules for the RCPP that include the various practices authorized by the Farm Bill, such as the Conservation Reserve Program and PL566 Authority, as well as a simplified application process. Um, outside of Title II, two quick comments. On adjusted gross income limitations, our working group supports the reestablishment of waiver authority of the adjusted income test for all conservation programs, and we urge NRCS to establish a process to allow waiver requests that result in a timely determination by the chief. On cover crops, we support the Farm Bill's clarification that cover crops should be considered a good farming practice. The working group urges RMA to work with stakeholders to educate farmers on cover crops meeting the definition of good farming practices. Thank you all very much for the time to submit comments, and we look forward to working with you in the future. All right, thank you. Just a reminder, we encourage everyone to submit um, their comments in writing as well. You still have a few more days to do that, ma'am. Good afternoon, Leah Biondo, Society for Range Management. Established in 1948, the Society for Range Management is the professional scientific society and conservation organization whose members are concerned with studying, conserving, managing, and sustaining the varied resources of rangelands. From our perspective, the range positions and initiatives underway need to be continually aligned as a priority. SRM provides research, networking, and training opportunities to all personnel involved in the management of rangelands. Federal employees need to be encouraged to be involved in SRM as members and supported to attend SRM annual training sessions and obtain SRM professional certifications. As a, SRM is a primary contractor to deliver trainings and services for NRCS personnel and we pride ourselves in providing innovative training models that are blazing a path in the 21st century. We appreciate the opportunity today to continually build on our successful private partner public 
or pu private public partnership and provide testimony to inform the implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill. Specifically, we'd like to address the provision under Title II, Chapter 4, Section 2303 regarding the Conservation Planning Assessment. The Conservation Planning Assessment serves as a pathway to enrollment in one of the many voluntary cost-share conservation programs offered by USDA. Acting as an initial consultation or orientation, the Conservation Planning Assessment pairs landowners with either qualified USDA NRCS conservationists, qualified conservation district staff, or a certified rangeland professional to assess the rangeland resource concerns that affect the ecological integrity of that land resource and make recommendations that are economically feasible for producers. As a certifying organization for rangeland professionals, SRM applauds this opportunity to supplement agency staff with highly qualified expertise from within our own ranks. This addition expands the services NRCS can provide to landowners. The Farm Bill has provided in excess of $1 billion supporting conservation practices on the nation's rangeland and pastures. These practices support control of invasive species, management of wildlife habitat, improved soil health, protection from wildfires, and livestock production for global food supply. SRM applauds past agency efforts, but is concerned that addressing individual resource concerns limits the long-term conservation achievements that are necessary to sustain productive rangeland ecosystems. Rangelands, like forests, require planning for the long term and 20 to 50 year planning horizons. However, unlike forests, rangelands support uh, livestock operations that require adaptive management with often daily feedback in order to facilitate long term objectives. To ensure the stewardship of these rangeland resources into the future, land managers will require continued technical assistance. This technical assistance comes through initial assessments, like the conservation planning assessment, but continues and is further validated through resource monitoring and producer follow-up. Producer follow-up and resource monitoring is where agencies truly realize the return on investment of conservation dollars. To maintain and safeguard these critical elements, continued training will be needed to ensure a trained workforce of employees and partners can meet the nation's ecological challenges. SRM stands ready to provide input and guidance regarding the implementation of these plans and programs and greatly appreciates the role that NRCS plays within these programs. Aside from the Farm Bill, SRM continues to urge both Congress and USDA to fill range conservationist vacancies and prioritize te technical assistance on working lands. We greatly appreciate the leadership and commitment that USDA provides to the rangelands community. Enhancing working lands and wildlife habitat truly is a private-public partnership success story. With your continued efforts and guidance, the best success stories are yet to come. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank SRM. Good Sorry, afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, it's Tom Franklin. I'm the Agriculture Liaison with the National Bob White Conservation Initiative. The MBCI is a unified strategic effort of 25 state fish and wildlife organizations and various conservation organizations that are working together to restore wild populations of the northern Bob White in this country to population levels comparable to 1980. Uh, the bird has been in severe decline since the 1960s due to uh, land use changes and uh, development of various kinds. The MBCI would like to highlight that the Farm Bill managers recognize the multiple benefits of native vegetation to improve water and air quality, soil health, and wildlife habitat. They encouraged USDA to use native vegetation where practicable. Following this congressional direction, we urge USDA to create a preference for the use of native vegetation, which remains voluntary and non-regulatory and promote the adoption and use of native plants and prioritize financial assistance for native plants and USDA programs on private lands. Native plants deliver multiple resource benefits providing a better investment for the taxpayer. Studies have shown that native grass buffers remove an average of 13.5% of total nitrogen and phosphorus than introduced grass buffers. They require one half the width of introduced grasses to provide the same function and remain functionally uh, functional longer. Native grasses have two times more depth root mass biomass as introduced species which adds structural reinforcement and organic matter to the soil. 
Native vegetation is drought tolerant and provides high quality forage for livestock during the growing season, reliably outperforming introduced cool season grasses during the summer months. Grassland birds experience 1.3 times greater nest success than in non-native pastures and hay fields, and many native pollinators, even the most endangered pollinators, rely exclusively on native vegetation for the re reproduction and survival. Native vegetation is a key factor in restoring declining upland birds like the northern bobwhite, lesser prairie chicken, greater sage grouse, and many other grassland bird species. By incorporating native vegetation, as the managers have emphasized, in all USDA practices where practicable, USDA can address and meet multiple conservation needs, including water and air quality, soil health, soil conservation, agriculture, and wildlife. Two other and very, very important points I just want to mention can greatly assist landowners to conserve the natural resources on their lands. They include the uh, CRP tree thinning and prescribed burning incentives and the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, wildlife practices. The Farm Bill provided up to $12 million in incentives for CRP tree thinning and prescribed burning to improve wildlife habitat, restore forest health, reduce wildfire risk, and reduce air pollution. We strongly urge USDA to provide these incentives to participants as soon as possible. It was somewhat delayed in the last Farm Bill, so we hope we can make that happen more quickly this time. With regard to EQIP, Congress allocated 10% of EQIP funding for wildlife practices, and we urge USDA to ensure that only true wildlife practices are used to achieve the intended wildlife benefits. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate that. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to join you uh, here today. I'm T.A. Hawks. I represent the Wetland Conservation Policy Coalition. The coalition is made up of a number of uh, conservation and land order, owner organizations, um, many of whom you've already heard from and will hear from today, uh, including uh, working solely on wetlands reserve easement, um, including the Nature Conservancy, Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, California Waterfowl, uh, Wildlife Mississippi, the Mississippi River Trust, and the Mississippi River uh, Landowners Alliance. WRE is one of the nation's most successful voluntary conservation programs. The program restores previously converted wetlands and provides willing landowners and producers with a financially viable option uh, to, for, to farming marginal land uh, while still retaining the ownership of the property. A study recently conducted by Doug Lawrence a respected natural resource economist and former USDA leader, uh, demonstrated that when land is enrolled in WRE, there are significant savings from government expenditures on other parts of uh, USDA, the commodity and crop insurance programs. For example, enrolling 100,000 acres of cropland in WRE annually would uh, approximately save 292 million over 10 years. In addition to these benefits, WRE also improves water quality and creates habitat for migratory birds. Uh, at-risk species and wild resident wildlife, which in turn boosts rural, rural economies as sportsmen and women uh, and other wildlife enthusiasts utilize these lands for recreation. In the 25 years since WRE's inception, almost 3 million acres have been restored and protected <coughs> with the cooperation of more than 15,000 landowners and producers. The program continues to be pro popular with America's landowners. Demand for WRE continually exceeds available funding with less than 25% of eligible applications accepted. The current backlog comprises more than 1,000 applications representing 180,000 acres or $400 million. The coalition has several specific recommendations to improve WRE. Uh, under Section 2604, uh, the coalition recommends the Secretary and NRCS provide a minimum of $30 million in funding annually beginning in FY19 for wetland reserve enhancement partner partnership opportunities. REPs are an excellent opportunity to leverage funding and target financial resources to address priority areas for wetland restoration. Partner requests for enhancement projects consistently exceed available funding throughout the 2014, the life of the 2014 Farm Bill. We recommend NRCS conduct a review of WRE application and acquisition procedures to streamline and increase efficiency of the enrollment process. The various procedural changes 
and a policy additions promulgated throughout the life of the program have made the enrollment process cumbersome and lengthy. Greater efficiency would simplify program implementation, enhance customer experience, increase landowner and producer interest, and reduce withdrawal of application submissions. Uh, thirdly, the coalition appreciates the recent focus on wet management of existing uh, wetland reserve easements. We recommend that NRCS continue to focus on management through science-based forest management and ve vegetation management that support migratory waterfowl and other wetland species. Under Section 2503, the coalition recommends an annual date be designed by which FSA must provide NRCS with a 25% cropland compliance report. Uh, we believe this would allow NRCS the efficiency to determine uh, ASAP and WRE uh, acreage limitations and identify which counties remain open uh, for new enrollment. And then under 17404, the WRE coalition strongly supports the reestablishment of waiver authority of the adjusted income test for WRE uh, and ASAP. We encourage NRCS to establish a process to allow for waiver requests that result in a timely determination by the chief in determining criteria for environmentally sensitive land of special significance for waiving AGI limitation for ASAP WRE. We recommend the secretary give the most consideration to those lands that can demonstrate significant linkages with the conservation objectives of migratory bird, wetlands conservation, water quality programs, plans, or and initiatives. The coalition uh, recommends that your colleagues at FSA work with the IRS to identify uh, a more efficient AGI certification process and develop one. Uh, increased efficiency such as automated certification system would greatly reduce certification time, enhance consumer service, and effectively em eliminate the requirement that producers must file refile because IRS was unable to provide certification within 120 days of application submission. WRE and all programs on requiring AGI certification would benefit from a more efficient AGI certification process. Thanks very much for allowing me to be here today. All right, thanks TA, thanks WRE. Pam, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ann Mesnikoff. I'm with the Environmental Law and Policy Center, which is based uh, in the Midwest in Great Lakes State, excuse me, Great Lakes States, but I'm here today on behalf of the Clean Water for All Coalition which is a broad coalition of environmental, conservation, sportsmen, and community groups standing together in support of clean water. One of our priorities is to engage in targeted efforts to reduce nutrient pollution, including through implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill. Before I jump to our conservation title priorities, I want to note that my organization testified this morning in the House Appropriations uh, in support of uh, increasing funding for the Great Lakes Regional Initiative, in part because of the growing problem of harmful algal, algal, algal blooms, uh, which are a result of uh, nutri excess nutrient pollution. So we appreciate the opportunity uh, to weigh in today on, on the Farm Bill and our priorities. We are pleased that the 2018 Farm Bill did not cut conservation title funding, and we urge the administration to not propose any cuts to the Farm Bill conservation programs in the forthcoming FY20 President's budget request. We urge the Secretary to refrain from any changes to the Swamp Buster Program, which did not see any significant changes in the, in the 2018 bill, uh, to ensure that the, that the program spirit is not undermined, including changes to the proposed interim final rule on the wetland conservation uh, published this past December that would result in a loss of protection for seasonal wetlands. We are pleased that the Farm Bill included new language to allow other, otherwise eligible producers operating on Ayers property to use certain forms of alternative documentation to secure farm numbers, expedi uh, farm numbers uh, and access conservation programs. We urge the uh, Secretary to implement these provisions expeditiously. Additionally, the Farm Bill increases resources for important programs that support groups providing outreach technical assistance, education, and training of, to historically underserved and new entry farmers and ranchers, helping to allow these producers to effectively utilize Farm Bill programs. We urge you to implement these expanded programs quickly, and we urge NRCS to, produce, uh, to provide additional outreach and promotion to further increase participation in working lands conservation programs from beginning uh, and socially disadvantaged producers. Sorry. Uh, we are pleased that the Farm Bill includes several new provisions on the conservation title to, uh, to increase emphasis on conservation activities to improve water quality, including offering greater 
incentives for producers to adopt high priority working lands practices, direct more riparian buffers enrolled in CRP and watersheds most heavily impacted by nu nutrient pollution sources and requiring that at least 10% of conservation title funding be devoted to protecting sources of drinking water. We urge you to move forward expeditiously with increased focus on practices that protect drinking water as well as implementation of the new CLEAR initiative within CRP. Additionally, we are pleased that the 2018 Farm Bill makes improvements to the, uh, to the CREP and RCPP to improve funding, sign up, and delivery of technical assistance as well as targeting of conservation resources. Sorry. And we urge you to actively solicit proposals in highly uh, high priority watersheds where nutrient pollution and drinking water remains a major challenge. We are disappointed that the Farm Bill does not include establishment of a, com a complete process to measure, evaluate, and report on the outcomes of conservation programs and practices. We believe there is still enormous opportunity to increase, avail uh, increase availability of this data. We urge you to move forward with building upon ongoing initiatives related to conservation outcomes and coordinate this work with tracking the efforts of practices and programs. Finally, the changes to the 2018 Farm Bill clarifying that cover crops should be uh, considered of good, a good farming practice provide important clarity to farmers and crop insurers, and we urge the risk management agency to work with stakeholders to, edu uh, to educate about these uh, changes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify on behalf of the Clean Water for All Coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming all the way out here from the Great Lakes area. Sir. Uh, good afternoon. Clark Micah with the Fertilizer Institute. Uh, thank you all for allowing us the opportunity to uh, submit public comments. We'll also be uh, uh, submitting more uh, in-depth comments via uh, Regulation Stack Gov. So I just want to highlight a couple things today, uh, starting with the uh, technical assistance program. So in the Farm Bill, uh, there is language regarding technical service providers. This is a uh, issue that we've been working on for many years with NRCS, and we appreciate the efforts thus far, but we think that we can uh, further, the, further enhance those efforts by working with the private sector, both uh, agricultural retailers, farmer-owned cooperatives, uh, on average they employ two uh, CCAs per facility. And we think those CCAs around the country would be a great complement uh, to the technical service provider program pending the application process, the certification process, et cetera, is uh, streamlined and made more attractive to those folks to participate. And I want to reiterate, we're not here to replace NRCS. We simply want to complement those efforts so that we can get more acres enrolled in nutrient management plans. Uh, the second piece uh, under the conservation title is um, both uh, EQIP and CSP recognize our fertilizer management best press practices uh, known as the four R's or source rate timing and placement of fertilizer. Uh, this is a priority not just for our industry but I think for the country as a whole we just heard the, the previous speaker talk about water quality challenges uh, when, when it comes to fertilizer, we think that the four R's are definitely the way to go. We would like to see uh, funding both within EQIP and CSP prioritized, as Congress mentions in the report language, to uh, those producers who are utilizing the four R's. And um, we think that, it, that also NRCS can play a role in educating farmers that these funds are available to do these practices. That's something that we uh, recently conducted a study about the four R's and farmer knowledge uh, and found that only about 25% of growers are actually doing what would be considered the full suite of the four R's. So there is a tremendous opportunity here, we think, with this farm bill, working with NRCS to not just uh, get the money out for these practices, but to educate farmers about these practices. And then finally, I know it's not something that you all work on, but I think it is important. We've heard. Uh, other, other folks mentioned the importance of measuring. Well, we like to, to talk about measuring in regards to research. We are very pleased that the Farm Bill actually has a fertilizer management initiative, uh, a high priority research extension initiative based on the four R's. So as NRCS works on the uh, nutrient management plans and implementing the plans, we also look forward to working with NIFA to research these uh, uh, not just for our plans that are, that are currently ongoing in the field, but also working with universities to conduct additional research to measure these practices. And if they're working, great, we can talk about it. And in fact, 
talk to folks, use case studies would be a great opportunity under the EQUIP program to talk about the good work that you're doing at NRCS so that when we have issues in Western Lake Erie and the Chesapeake Bay and Florida, you name it, we can take the, the good work, the public dollars that are being invested and tell that good story. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today and we look forward to work with you to implement the Farm Bill. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm Jenny Connor Nelms. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for the Nature Conservancy, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. On behalf of over one million members of the Nature Conservancy and our staff in every state and internationally, I'd like to share our recommendations for the implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill. And I'll just note that these, um, these comments reflect feedback from our organization, not only as a partner with USDA, um, but also as an agricultural landowner. The Nature Conservancy owns over 500,000 acres of production agriculture. So we manage and own quite a bit of land across America. I'll start with easements, the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. In general, the Conservancy supports an approach that leaves maximum discretion to NRCS because each easement transaction has its own set of unique circumstances that requires flexibility to close the transaction. We encourage NRCS to fully enable the state conservationist in each state to exercise the flexibility desired to advance each transaction. And I'm going to use most of the time in this section to talk about the agricultural land easement because you just heard from Mr. Hawks from the wetland, um, from the WRE coalition that included many of our um, wetland comments and we also have already submitted those in writing. So we support the elimination of the ale plan and we urge NRCS to only require a conservation plan when highly erodible land is present on the property. We will continue to write uh, conservation plans for properties under easement, but we appreciate the flexibility and um, without the rigidity of the previous planning process. We recommend that NRCS include explicit recognition of forest land eligibility and clarify that ale can be used on up to 100% forest land. This is an issue that hindered conservation efforts under the previous farm bill um, with private landowners and we think that you can correct this as the agency implements the new farm bill and we look forward to working with you. We support the inclusion of improving water quality in program priorities, and we believe that national ranking criteria should be updated to reflect that addition. Moving on to EQIP, we strongly support the Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program. Some of our partners have talked about this already. In the allowance of 10-year contracts for wildlife practices, we encourage NRCS to establish rules for the seasonal wetland habitat for waterfowl and migratory birds that are flexible so that 10-year contracts <clears throat> are permitted. We urge NRCS to interpret this broadly and to implement it on a large scale with agricultural producers. The Conservancy supports the authorization of NRCS to enter into contracts with irrigation districts and similar entities for payments that are effectively conserve water, provide fish and wildlife habitat, or provide for drought-related environmental mitigation. We urge NRCS to work closely with Western growers and their water suppliers to ensure that new EQIP contracting authority translates into greater water conservation, improved fish and wildlife habitat, and more resilient agricultural communities. We support the establishment of new soil health demonstration trials, and we urge NRCS to focus on how to implement soil health practices on more acres across the U.S. while stressing economic outcomes and utilizing new technologies like remote sensing and modeling that are useful at the landscape scale. NRCS should also leverage existing opportunities and resources like the Soil Health Partnership and Operational Tillage Information System, OPTIS. As a close partner with NRCS on RCPP projects around the country, we're excited about some of the changes included in the Farm Bill and we look forward to continuing our great partnership with your agency on this program. We believe the most important of these is that NRCS should create a separate RCPP contract distinct from the other contracts. The agreement should be based on covered program practices and contract terms and should allow for more flexibility when possible from those contract terms. We support a simplified application process. Program rules should be revised so that eligible partners do not have to certify partner contribution at the time of application, but rather prior to RCPP contract execution. 
And I'll wrap up with just a few comments that cut across the conservation title. The Nature Conservancy strongly supports the reestablishment of waiver authority of the adjusted gross income test for all conservation programs. We encourage NRCS to establish a process to allow for waiver requests that results in timely determination by the chief. And we recommend that FSA work with the IRS to develop a more efficient AGI certification process. We support the new practices and purposes that focus on climate change adaptation and mitigation, including carbon sequestration and storage. We support the establishment of the report on USDA data on conservation practices. And we support the changes to the Watershed Protection and Flood Prevention Act that make it newly applicable to drought resilience in the West. We thank Congress for passing the Farm Bill, and we look forward to working with our partners at USDA on these important conservation programs for America. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you, Jane. Thank the Nature Conservancy. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Cindy Ayers, a social disadvantaged and beginning farmer from Jackson, Mississippi. NRCS equip program helped me to become a farmer. It helped me to build my farm. I'm very thankful for that. At the same time, even though this farm bill maintained this program, they failed to increase the allocations for the set asides for the social disadvantaged and beginning farmers in the major conservation programs, CSP and equipped. Now I stand here to speak for millions of small farmers who just like me believed and still believe in this American dream of USDA, United States Department of Agriculture for the people. As a small farmer from a rural area, I can tell you that without this equip program, small farmers like me would not exist. It's because of this we're able to be better stewards for this great land. I ask you to consider the easement and the restoration for the WRP and the WRE program. If you look over the last years, you will see and should be able to measure the percent of the funds that was obligated for minority landowners and minority contractors. I urge you to consider, to go back and look, and to see what else can do in order to help maintain and to help build more and to create more new farmers, beginning farmers, throughout this country. A lot of them just happen to be small farmers and socially disadvantaged. I hope that these great ears and this great audience and all these great groups that have stood up to say what we can do and what we should do, I hope they too include in their practices that they're talking about and utilizing this great bill that they don't forget that we too are disadvantaged minority farmer also needs to have access to some of these great programs. I'm Cindy Ayers, and I am a farmer. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. We appreciate all your comments today. Sir? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Quentin Robinson. I'm with the uh, Rural Coalition. And I know that we're on the conservation title, but I have a few comments uh, regarding credit, if that's appropriate. Sure. Okay, thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, uh, as you know, this farm bill uh, went to great lengths to uh, mention uh, the term family farmers, uh, new and beginning farmers, um, and, and veteran farmers, and, and we're very, very appreciative to that. And also, this farm bill uh, went to great lengths to uh, uh, add new provisions that would uh, provide extra protections to keep family farms on the land that they're on. And so I just want to point out two provisions and make a couple of recommendations uh, that I think will be meaningful in the recommendation process. Uh, as regards to section 5304, which deals with the term uh, equitable relief in the credit title, as we know, equitable relief is a, uh, is a provision that's commonly associated with uh, NRCS programs. And so uh, Congress was, uh, was kind enough to work with us to make a similar equitable relief provision available to the credit title. And the way this language reads, and I'll paraphrase it, basically says that if uh, an FSA uh, employee during the credit servicing or during the credit uh, making process 
uh, makes an in intentional mistake or if it's a, a mistake that's unintentional uh, and it causes uh, the family farmer to be placed in default and foreclosure, then the family farmer uh, has a right under this new language to uh, petition the secretary for equitable relief. And so that doesn't give the family farmer to uh, a free ticket to not pay the debt. It just gives the family farmer an opportunity to work with the secretary to devise a plan to correct the error that was made, not by the farmer, but the error that was made by the FSA employee. And so we think that's a fair provision. It sort of marries what happens uh, in, in the FSA, no, I'm sorry, in the NRCS context when you get a NRCS contract that's outside of the uh, outside of the law, so to speak, uh, you can go back and correct it. And this, this just applies to the credit title. And or one thing that we would, we would ask in the implementation stage is sort of a dual process. One would be, I think you're going to find, once that this is the law, uh, farmers who would like to take advantage of this provision as it's written today, and, I, and it does becomes, become effective immediately. Uh, if, if during your implementation stage you could get a notice out to the field immediately that this provision uh, is available and uh, that the farmers be given specific notice that they can make a petition to the secretary immediately for equitable relief in credit provisions uh, as, it, as it meets the requirements of the statute. And then secondly, uh, and this is a, a, another provision um, that really helps to keep the family farmer on the land. You know, we've had all the floods in North Carolina's fires and other place, places. The, the old law said that if you had a debt write down as a part of a servicing request uh, anytime after uh, 1996, you were not eligible for an emergency loan. Uh, Congress was kind enough in this farm bill to strike that provision from the law. And so if you have a farmer in North Carolina or anywhere in the country that's had even $1,000 of debt write down previously, they would not be eligible for an emergency loan. This law, this section changes that. And so we would ask you in your implementation phase to, impl to, uh, to speedily implement that. Once again, sending out a notice to the field that this provision is available now because I think there are a lot of farmers that would take advantage of it. And so, once again, appreciate you having this session. I think it's very helpful to all of us, and we look forward to working with you on other provisions uh, as we implement the Farm Bill. Great. Thank you so much. We appreciate that feedback, and uh, taking some notes for FSA here. Sir? Good afternoon. I think, uh, oh, second to last. Okay. Uh, great to see you all. Uh, my name is Colin O'Neill. I'm the legislative director for the Environmental Working Group. Um, we're an environmental health nonprofit based here in Washington, D.C., with offices in Minnesota as well as California and many staff scattered around. Um, one issue that received considerable attention from lawmakers in the 2018 Farm Bill was the threat that nutrient, po uh, nutrient runoff poses to drinking water supplies um, and the millions of Americans who are drinking water with elevated levels of nitrate and other agricultural contaminants. Federal conservation programs can play a key role in preventing runoff from entering sources of drinking water, and the 2018 Farm Bill thankfully recognized that and provides NRCS, FSA, and other agencies within USDA with new tools that will allow the department to better target conservation programs on the most important practices that are also the most effective at protecting sources of drinking water. Uh, the 2018 Farm Bill, as you recognize, requires better coordination between NRCS, FSA, and other agencies within USDA. And we, as well as many of our colleagues, believe that USDA can most effectively coordinate and leverage conservation programs managed by all of those agencies within USDA through a department-wide water quality initiative, which would target conservation investments in priority watersheds, as well as wellhead protection areas. The 2018 Farm Bill will provide producers with even more ways to establish conservation activities on their operations that can reduce nutrient pollution, pollution from entering sources of drinking water. NRCS should implement these changes made by the Farm Bill so they are complementary. And it should better rely on current NRCS evaluation tools like the Conservation Practice Physical Effects Matrix and the Watershed Analyses of the Conservation Effects Assessment Project, or SEEP so that USDA is paying for the right practices in the right places. Specifically, uh, we believe on a couple things. Uh, we believe the NRCS should reserve the newly established 90% payment rates for high priority practices for continuous enrollment. 
meaning that producers that want to establish one of the 10 conservation practices that are identified within a state for those states that do choose to do so, uh, producers can be immediately enrolled in EQIP to establish those high priority practices. In addition, we urge NRCS to devote enrollment to management and vegetative practices, uh, which are often more cost effective and often receive higher NRCS evaluations according to the SEEP and CPPE for addressing drinking water challenges. With regards to the newly established EQIP incentive practices, uh, the conference report states that managers anticipate incentive practices with broad resource benefits and to incentivize increased levels of conservation around locally established resource priorities. To meet Congress's expectations, we urge NRCS to firmly establish EQIP incentive contracts as a sub-program devoted to the development and full implementation of comprehensive pollution prevention conservation systems. In addition, NRCS should focus EQIP incentive contracts on a targeted number of resource impairments, things like nutrients in groundwater and surface water, to be addressed within a particular watershed or, or, um, or wellhead protection area. EWG analysis of two decades of conservation spending has found that all too often, conservation investments are spread too thin across the agricultural landscape and across too many resource concerns to make any serious inroads in any one critical category such as drinking water. Um, finally, NRCS should accelerate enrollment for producers participating in a new water quality initiative to be eligible for the EQIP incentive contracts. Now, switching gears to CSP, uh, the changes made uh, by the 2018 Farm Bill offer NRCS a unique opportunity to do more to protect public health and drinking water. In particular, prioritizing bundles uh, as a way of shifting production practices, transitioning to more sustainable forms of farming like organic and pasture-based grazing methods, and targeting enrollment. Um, finally, we're really excited about the CLEAR initiative and changes to CREP. Um, we think that they offer a unique opportunity to continuously enroll more buffers around rivers and streams, and we urge the department uh, to uh, solicit proposals in key watersheds and wellhead protection areas to make sure that they are fully taken advantage of. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you on implementation. Thank you. Very thoughtful comments. We appreciate that. Okay, <laughs> back again. My name is Lorette Pachano with the Rural Coalition. This time I want to raise comments also on behalf of um, several of our member groups, which also include the Rural Advancement Fund and the National Sharecroppers Fund in South Carolina, Oklahoma Black Historical Research Project, National Hmong Farmers, around a couple of issues that relate to conservation. Um, one of them, and we've raised this earlier, is the need to implement um, the provisions for alternate forms of documentation for farmers operating on heirs' property, and I believe that was raised by a couple of our colleagues, um, partly because when you're looking at um, taking care of the land, it's very important that you take care of all the land, and if, you know, like for example in Oklahoma, with the in, um, invasive species like eastern red cedar taking over 800 acres of land a day, um, if you're missing a number of the small farms, you're not going to be able to mitigate in, um, invasive species effectively. And we've actually been doing research with a team of American University students, and one of the things we found out are there significant, you know, plots of land that farmers can't operate because if you're cow-calf operation and you got 18 or 20 acres of eastern red cedar, you can't afford your operation. Um, so we urge that. The other thing is, on the set-asides and the higher cost shares, we've worked very hard on getting all of those tools um, implemented. And, you know, we appreciate the long partnership that we've had with NRCS and, you know, the welcoming attitude um, towards our communities and the relationships, and that's enabled us to kind of learn things. And one of the things that we've been hearing is, you know, our understanding is the set-asides for socially disadvantaged and beginning farmers are not intended to be a, a ceiling. They're supposed to be a floor. And we found that in some places they're implemented differently than they are in other places. So what we've also heard is once the pool is exceeded of the 5% for socially disadvantaged farmers, then any other farmers need to move into the larger pool, which is fine, but at that point they're not afforded the higher cost share that they're entitled to. And so is there a uniform instruction on how that piece is implemented? So we think that that piece would be um, also incredibly important. 
And we're also very glad now to see the inclusion of both the acequias and also um, the land grants, especially in New Mexico, and the need also to, to um, put conservation in, and increase um, um, how much conservation there is. And, you know, we raise our concern also about forest fires that are endemic in many places, and they're happening more also now in California. And, you know, the really, the need to work with populations in dealing with the small scale farmers and ranchers. Um, and if you want to look at a county that's successful, we're also here on behalf of World Farmers, up in Worcester County, Massachusetts, they've developed a team approach. And there's high tunnels, you know, with um, refugee women farmers operating on very small segments of land um, in, a in a state wildlife refuge. And so how can you look at what are the positive things that are happening in research con uh, conservation when the programs are effectively delivered. And, you know, beyond that, we want to thank you very much for the long partnership we've had. Thanks. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Are there any more comments this afternoon at the moment? All right. I'm going to, uh, Matt, did you have any parting words you'd like to say? or? Just uh, really appreciate everyone's input. Uh, a lot of great discussion here today. So thanks for taking the time to come and share. All right. And we want to thank everyone again for your comments. Um, not sure what we want to do here. I'm trying to take my cues. Oh, yes. I was wondering if the undersecretary was here. He is here. I've been trying to point him, you know, locate him in the audience here. It's like, where's Waldo? But uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up here. I'll turn it over to, to Bill. Well, Waldo's at the podium, I guess. So <laughs> thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. And, and, and again, let me add my thanks to, uh, to all of you for, for taking time, the thoughtful comments that you all had as well. You maybe saw on the agenda, we had a, uh, a closing section here to be able to talk about customer service, uh, our attention on that, your ideas for that as well. We certainly take any other comments that you would have about any program areas. There were a lot of comments as we went through the day. Um, I was able to catch some of them here, some of them back at my desk, uh, as well as you talked about the coordination of our programs, the need for us to be able to have the same rules within uh, the same mission area. And so the whole effort around customer service has always been a part of uh, the agencies uh, that are in front of you today uh, and that uh, you have engaged uh, with many times, but, in, but us, together uh, as part of a mission area of farm production and conservation uh, was brought together by Secretary Purdue and that idea of the three most customer facing parts of USGA and there's a lot of other parts of USGA that do a lot of things with a lot of customers but for many of the folks in the ag community out there when they think of the agencies uh, that they work with directly and indirectly uh, it's certainly Risk Management Agency, NRCS, and FSA. Uh, and from time to time, we still do, and you had some comments on that today. Do we have conflicting rules and regulations around conservation and, and uh, crop insurance or between FSA and NRCS? Certainly, we do lots of things together. Uh, we coordinate some activities. We're looking at more ways to coordinate those activities. Um, as they develop separately, certainly NRCS uh, develops separately in many ways than FSA and RMA, which were already in the same mission area. We develop separate IT systems, uh, other kinds of procedures, and we're looking at ways of pulling those things together so that it's e more easy to share information, uh, that it's more easy to have similar forms, to even have forms that fill themselves out a little bit as a producer comes in the office and we don't have to restart with the name and address and many of the other uh, information uh, while somebody's standing at the counter uh, and then we can reduce the number of forms and that information that is de uh, that is gathered someplace can populate a form that that certainly takes less time for our staff that's limited out there 
but also for the producers that are impacted. We're looking for ways to be able to get more of the activities online as well. Not as a replacement for our service centers. We need uh, the folks in the service centers. Uh, you all talked about certainly some of the challenges of implementing new programs. They are not all easily understood by every producer in every circumstance. We need somebody at a counter uh, where somebody can walk up and have a conversation. But there's going to be times when you just need to f sign a form. Uh, and you're a long ways away and you could be able to sign that form online. Uh, we even had some folks that signed up for the market facilitation program online as well. Didn't need to come into the office. They already had an uh, e-authentication uh, to be able to do that. We want to provide more opportunities for that to be able to happen. Uh, we heard comments today certainly about staff levels and we're looking to make sure that we get back up closer to our ceilings that we have. Our ceilings are steady with what they've been, but we still are struggling uh, to be able to get fully staffed in all the offices. We've gone through some good measuring to figure out out of the 2,124 offices and uh, across our FSA system uh, are 2,500-ish offices in the NRCS system that, that we're putting people in the right place. That we're trying to make sure that, that we address the needs uh, where the needs are the greatest. Um, and that is a challenge because it's different in different places. Program delivery is different. It can be even different in different seasons. Uh, certainly, uh, if you have disasters that go through an area, we will often find ourselves short-staffed and a need for jump teams and other ways of trying to make sure uh, that we're getting our regular programs done, but that we're able to respond to the disasters that are happening as well. Uh, so I would like each of our folks, not necessarily long preparation, but to be able to talk just a little bit about some of the things that they're doing in customer service. Um, and then I would love for you all to be able to, uh, to share any ideas that you all would have. Uh, I know we heard a lot of it today, uh, and certainly if there's no additional comments, we understand that, but if you all would have additional comments uh, about how we can do things better, how we can make the program delivery more effective, uh, that's something very important to all of us. Uh, it's certainly important to our boss. Secretary Purdue talks about it often. You have seen him on the road in most states across this country and many, many times, um, several, many of the states out there several times. Um, I've actually about ready to hit my one year anniversary uh, as your undersecretary and I've gotten to I think about 30 states out there so I'm still a long ways behind the secretary uh, in his travels and our administrators travel like crazy. In fact, Keith is up here because Martin's back on the road again. Um, we think it's important to be able to get out and listen, get to our offices, talk to our customers, and understand what we can do that will help these programs be delivered in a better way. So with that, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Undersecretary, for kind of setting the, the premise to we'll have this discussion here. And you know, when, within our CS, we have, as, as he said, 2,500 district offices all across the country and over 9,000 employees. We interact a lot with our farmers and ranchers and forestry owners. And that interaction on a daily basis all across this country is so very important to make sure that we're giving our producers the most positive experience they can. So when I came on board a few months ago as chief and we started having these discussions of how can we make sure that when folks leave, our NRCS office that they have a positive experience and so just to highlight a couple of things that we're working on we, really for us we have a state conservationist someone who leads NRCS at every state and it's very important to make sure that we have set the standard for them and what we expect of them and the way they lead their staff and the way they interact so we've initiated some new performance evaluation standards and the goal is as we can begin to really capture the effectiveness of how well our state leaders are doing to be able to roll this down to the area level and then the district level to make sure that all of our employees are being held to those same standards to make sure that their interactions with partners, interaction with, with customers, interaction with other leaders in their communities, whether it's local or state level, are really being captured and they're being the most effective they can because as the undersecretary said, customer service is so very important in the way we deliver our programs, the way we, we interact and the way we manage. So that's one thing that we've initiated 
Also, uh, it's, we've had lots of discussions with our, our customer groups around the country when we travel. It's been extremely helpful. And one of the things that we're learning is sometimes new employees that, that are right out of school, maybe, maybe new to agriculture, certainly new to production agriculture. Uh, maybe they're even new to an area within a state or within a region or the country. Sometimes they've got the, the technical skills, but maybe they don't really understand the boots on the ground way that agriculture is operated in that area. So we're kind of exploring some ideas of maybe creating a mentorship in fact, we had a discussion this morning at breakfast, how can we take seasoned producers in a community who are experts in environmental practices, especially within that, that geographical area, to kind of mentor some of these new employees, bring them out to the farm, spend some time, give them the opportunity to, to kick the rocks on the ground and ask questions and try to mentor them. And again, I think that if we can really try to find a way to, to take our new employees or employees that are new to an area and match that up with uh, seasoned veteran producers and really try to train them, I think it's going to have lasting effects because again, these are the folks that are having the direct interaction with our, with our customers and we want to make sure that they are not only book smart, but they've got the experience to go along with that uh, being, being on those farms. And then the last one I'll mention, Jimmy Bramlett's down here is, is uh, just doing a great work when we think about the way we deliver our programs through the computer programs and uh, we hear a lot that, you know, dealing with the federal government can be cumbersome, and, and you mentioned it as well. Uh, computer programs are, are cumbersome and repetitive sometimes, especially going from, from the FSA office over to the NRCS office. So we've got some initiatives in place to really try to streamline that, the way we collect that data, the way we capture, the way we score and rank that data, and the way we can effectively deliver our programs. But again, when you develop new programs, it's a lengthy process, but we're really, uh, we want to make that uh, improved for lack of a better word. And again, we're, we've got some neat things that we're working on to help improve that end result for our customers. So uh, customer service is very important in RCS. And I just want you to know that we are trying to address things on all levels and look forward to being able to implement the Secretary's vision uh, to make us more effective, efficient, and focused on that customer experience. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you again for spending a, a big part of your day with us. Um, the comments that were, uh, were presented certainly are going to be helpful as we continue to navigate through implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, you know, this, this part uh, of, the, of the session talking about customer experience, customer service, I think is really important. And the Undersecretary said that, uh, I don't know exactly how he said it, but the Secretary is very serious about that. It's not a suggestion. Um, it, is, it is a way of doing business. And, and certainly at the Farm Service Agency, um, we take that very seriously. Um, now, while we don't quite have as many offices as Matt has, 2,124 county offices, um, we take a great deal of pride in the customer service that we, uh, as an agency, uh, deliver and have exhibited, I think, for a long, long time. Um, for those of you who weren't in the room this morning, um, my really, really short bio is I was a full-time farmer for about 30 years. So I was the customer. I was the customer on the other side of the counter. And, and the thing about our employees in the field um, is they are the local experts. They're the ones that, uh, that, that, that help producers navigate through new programs, explain how they work, whether they're on the program side or the farm loan side, um, and in, ingrained in that community. And certainly, um, certainly do a, a really good job of delivering exceptional customer service. We always, though, look for opportunities, we look for ways to improve that customer service because we know, um, you know, we, we, we know that we're doing a, a good job, we can do a better job uh, in delivering that customer service. Uh, the Undersecretary mentioned uh, more opportunities to participate remotely. And again, another priority of the Secretary is to move uh, FPAC into, um, into this century when it comes to delivering delivering farm programs and farm loan programs. So we continually look at not only how are our, how are our employees um, delivering and administering programs, but what are things that we can do to, um, to streamline that process and to make it simpler. Um, if, if, uh, if a producer, for example, would need to interact with FSA, NRCS, and RMA, uh, is there a way that we can streamline um, forms? Is there a way that we can just require one signature instead of hitting all three agencies and, and, and requiring three signatures. 
We just, um, we're just kind of finishing up with, uh, with a program I'm sure all of you have heard of, the Market Facilitation Program. And that program was put together fairly quickly and it needed to be, uh, it needed to, to deliver um, to producers and it needed to be something that was streamlined. Um, because we were adding additional, uh, additional uh, tasks to our, to our staff and we really wanted to make sure that we were going to be able to implement it in a timely fashion. And so I think um, if you look at that program and, and, and the implementation of that program, um, fewer touches by our employees to, to get from application to finalizing that application and getting a payment out the door um, was something that, something that was certainly a priority for us. And, and I think we were able to uh, accomplish that and we continue to look at ways and look for ways to be able to do that in the future. Um, I think we have, uh, you know, right now, uh, currently at USDA, we've got, a, we've got a lot of folks that have been that customer on the other side of the counter that are in, they're in key positions that are making decisions about how we deliver exceptional customer service. And so as we look from that lens, I believe we're going to be able to make some strides that will truly uh, be meaningful. Um, when it relates to that interaction that we have between, um, between our, the folks that work for us and the folks that we work for. And it's, you know, it's, it really is, it really is uh, a humbling opportunity, frankly, because we get, to, we get to do some really amazing things. And that is to serve America's farmers, ranchers, and forest stewards um, in doing probably some of the most noble work that anyone can do, and that's producing food and fiber. And we're going to do our level best to, um, to, to do what we can to really create uh, efficient, effective customer service that's meaningful and will carry on um, in the future. So look forward to your comments and your input on how we can possibly do that. I think we're on the road. We're well on our way to being able to do that. But, uh, but the opportunity to hear from you is going to be, is going to be great. So. Uh, again, thanks for your patience today, and uh, turn over to Keith. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm here on behalf of the administrator, uh, Mark Barbary, uh, for the Risk Management Agency. Uh, the Under Undersecretary mentioned he is already wheels up or should be uh, on his way to meet with more stakeholder and producer groups on how we can continually improve our customer service. Uh, the risk management agency uh, across the FPAC mission, uh, the farm production and conservation mission area, uh, we have 16 offices uh, that cover the United States uh, as well as Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico. Um, our customer service, as has been mentioned here, uh, we're always being asked and being, uh, being asked to focus with a laser-like intensity on how we can continue to increase uh, service to our customers. Who are our customers? Well, the, we have a public-private partnership. We work hand-in-hand -hand with uh, approved insurance providers and insurance agents in providing the one program that we administer on behalf of the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, and that's the Federal Crop Insurance Program. Uh, with uh, covering 558 crops and uh, 40, approximately 40 crops or practices per county across the United States. Um, we also, in addition to having our AIPs as customers, our agents as customers, our uh, farmers and ranchers are our customers whom we uh, service and, and backstop the farm, uh, the, uh, the farm programs uh, through the multi peril crop insurance program and the private products. Uh, we also have the general public as our customers, Congress as a customer, uh, folks like yourselves that represent uh, st state or national or regional associations, academic institutions, state agencies. We interact with all of these folks that I just mentioned on a regular basis. Uh, why do we do that? Because we want to know how we can do things better. Uh, the administrator, uh, as he mentioned in his earlier remarks this morning, is a farmer. Uh, grew up on a farm, uh, continues to farm with his son in southern Illinois. So he gets it. He understands what it's like to be a customer. And so he's always focusing on our agency at RMA. How can we do things better, make things? We use a whole farm or a whole team concept uh, in, in addressing uh, customer service to farmers and ranchers. Uh, and that includes our leadership, 
our employees and our customers. We all interact together. We also, through the direction, the Undersecretary and the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, engage in periodic and regular uh, inward-looking uh, process and efficiency type of, of uh, looks in our program to make sure that we're doing the best we can, as, as mentioned earlier, to reduce any pain points through the process. Uh, we've been charged in looking at customer service. We want to become faster, friendly, friendlier, and easier. Uh, to to ensure that the farmer and rancher is getting uh, the best risk management tool available and that's the federal crop insurance program uh, it's been my pleasure along with our staff with Dolores Steen our acting deputy administrator for insurance services she oversees uh, the 10 regional offices across the country as well as uh, earlier Heather Manzano was here uh, our deputy administrator uh, for compliance. We also had uh, our uh, policy advisor, R.J. Lair, here, uh, and our folks in Kansas City, uh, where our other uh, larger presence in product management, our management and our uh, deputy administrator for product management uh, is, is Richard uh, Flournoy is also listening as well. So uh, thank you for being part of this process. It is a process. I can assure you uh, we are working as hard and expeditiously as possible to get information and uh, the Farm Bill implementation out as soon as we can. Thank you. All right, I wanted to take this moment to ask, does anyone else have any final comments? Would they like to come forward and ask that we've got all of the subject matter experts right here? All right, we'll, we'll start over here, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Thank you, my brother Rudy. Um, so I just want to um, just comment on section 12403 of the 2018 Farm Bill, which requires the USDA to complete a civil rights impact analysis of the department's employment and federally conducted and federally assisted programs and activities in accordance with the department's regulation 4300-004 in two years. It also requires that the Controller General of the, United, of the U.S. to complete um, a report on the effectiveness of the um, civil rights um, um, implementation across the agency, including looking at how complaints are resolved on minority farm program participation rates and all related issues. Uh, in terms of implementation, we are recommending that it is very important that the Farm Bill programs are implemented, that the USDA assures that the systems are set in place to consider possible disparate impact and how to mitigate these in delivery of its program. The Farm Bill managers noted with respect to the required analysis in um, 12403 that any proposed action or policy would have, that could have unintended consequences need to be part of this civil rights impact analysis. Further, we agree with the farm managers that the secretary should utilize the civil rights impact analysis as an opportunity to proactively identify these impacts and if possible, implement changes to the proposed activity to ensure that the department's actions and policies do not have a negative civil rights impact. Proactive measures must be adopted to assure equity and fair access to USDA farm conservation credit and risk management program. Both must, be, must address the delivery mechanism as well as federally sponsored or guaranteed programs, including guaranteed loans and crop insurance. I would also like to note that we have gotten the uh, receipt for service and we want to make sure that we get as much information as possible that is usable by the agency to track how the delivery of their services is being done across race, gender um, consideration. We will also like to work with the uh, Secretary of Agriculture and leaders of the department in fully implementing the heirs' property provision. 
In closing, I would just like to ask the Secretary to fully um, use his budgetary authority to implement the photo, the local um, food program, LAMP, and the relending program, and, because I, and as well as the um, mediation program at state level. I think those are really good programs and could give us the, the customer service that we, we have been dreaming about and want to see implemented. And um, we are willing to work with the agency to lend assistance, not just by commenting, but just to sit down and sh do a sharing of experiences from our years in the field. And some of us go back to 1987 when some of these civil rights provision were enacted in the Farm Bill. So um, we look forward to working with you. And it's been a really good day hearing from each and every one of you. And thank you. Uh, for sitting through the course and listening to us. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Sir. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, and thank you, gentlemen, for uh, uh, having this uh, uh, session. Really appreciate it. We look forward to working with you. However, I want to bring up something that has, is a pet peeve of mine, and that is, I am no government customer. I am a citizen with all the privileges, rights and privileges that entails, and by calling me a customer, I feel that it, it strips me of my ability to redress grievances. I protested this during a time that then Vice President Al Gore, with his reinvention of government, brought that term into our government. So, and I have requested ever since, and every opportunity that I have, to bring that up because I'm not a customer of yours. You know, you're, you're public servants, I'm a stakeholder, and have the right for redress of grievances with regard to any and all programs that it are to be serving to the public. So that's one thing. The other is, uh, you know, um, so I just want that to bring that as a major concern of mine and our, our members uh, that we represent. The other is, you know, as farmers, oftentimes we need to have some of your offices available for a weekend, say a Saturday morning, because we work all day. As you know, those of you who, who are farmers, if there's a good day, we're not going to take time to go to the USD office where you may or you may not get what it is that you are requesting. And so you don't want to lose that day, particularly in this weather that is so erratic. So I am requesting that if at all possible, perhaps some of your staff could be, uh, in, during, the, during the time that give us a Saturday, half, half a day on a Saturday. Okay? Thank you, sir. Thank you very, look forward to working with you. All right, any, any more comments? <clears throat> Now's the time. All right. Well, thank you, all of you, for all the, uh, the great comments today. I wanted to let you know we have handouts of the Farm Bill uh, just outside the auditorium here. If you'd like to take one home, those are all sitting there. And I will turn it over to the Undersecretary for the last word. Thank you, Sean, and thank you for a great job today. Let me introduce Bob Stevenson. But way back here, Bob. Bob is our Chief Operating Officer of the FPAC Business Center. So. One of the other adjustments that was made was taking the administrative functions of each of the three agencies, putting them together in the business center so the agencies can focus on, on programs. Um, you know all the change, not only the change of changing mission areas, but then the business center is, is a lot of change for a lot of folks. But uh, thank you, Bob, for, for leading that effort and his team. Um, let me just say, first of all, uh, customer is not meant as any offense. Uh, it is meant to motivate our folks uh, to, to make sure that they're caring about what is important to the folks that we work with. And I'll tell you, one of the best examples is uh, as we get out and around, I uh, get to a lot of county offices and talk to some of our farmers out there and ranchers and folks that are working on uh, forest projects and other kinds of things. Um, and one of the things that started to occur to me is how often I heard the phrase, as if it's almost one word, uh, our farmers. 
Um, I'd be in an office in North Dakota and they'd say, our farmers really need this program to work better. And I'd be in Arkansas and they'd say, our farmers need this to be able to work better. We need this for our farmers. Um, and so you'll see a few times uh, when we think about it, we're able to use hashtag our farmers. Um, when you talk to the folks in the countryside, and I hope you get the same feeling when you talk to the folks here or in state offices. Uh, there is a real desire to make sure that we're doing the kinds of things that work for our folks out there. The real families uh, that go home, uh, that are challenged financially, that have lots of other challenges besides fitting into our program. Uh, so that we can be relevant, that we can be solution oriented, that we can fit into their own individual circumstance. And I, we have the same conversations when we, uh, when we come back is how charged up we are to, to uh, try and make sure that we're doing everything to do the right thing uh, so that our folks in the countryside um, are able to help um, folks with the programs uh, that we're there to, to, uh, to deliver. So again, thank you for being a part of this. Um, we certainly welcome comments online through this section um, on farmers.gov. Isn't it on farmers.gov? Through March 1st. Uh, so certainly do that. Uh, we'll continue to take um, comments on farmers.gov for suggestions, whether it's customer service suggestions, farm bill suggestions, other kinds of things. You'll see us out and around as well. Uh, we're in this rulemaking time where we're not able to discuss all the things uh, that we're thinking about and exactly um, what we will do in some of those programs, but we are always interested in what you have to say about what we can do to make sure it works for you and the folks that you all know. So again, thank you for uh, taking time to be a part of us. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. I just figured that out.